Good evening and welcome to the April 11th, 2024 meeting of the Citrus Heights City Council. If I could ask everybody to please stand and join me in the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States Next item, please. Next item is a uh, roll call. Council Member uh, Lopez Taff. Here. Council Member Middleton. Here. Council Member Schaefer. Here. Vice Mayor Karpinski Costa. Present. And Mayor Daniels. Here. Next item, please. This meeting of the Citrus Heights City Council is cable cast live on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on the Comcast Consolidated Communications and AT&T U-verse cable systems. This meeting is closed captioned and live streamed at citrusheights.net. Tonight's meeting replays on Monday, April 15th at 9 a.m. on Channel 14. This meeting can also be viewed at the city's YouTube channel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next item, please. Next item is approval of agenda. And Mayor, I would just like to note that department report item number 15, the police department annual report, um, has been moved to a future city council meeting. Thank you. And then also, um, there has been a little bit of confusion that um, an item uh, regarding murals was going to be heard tonight. And so if you're here for that, uh, I'm sorry, but that was not on the agenda. There was just a little bit of confusion. Did I get that right, Amy? And Correct. It'll be in a future meeting. Yeah. So, so just wanted to let you know so that you're not sitting here waiting for that item to be called. And with that, um, I'll uh, take a, an, a uh, motion for the agenda. Move approval. Second. I second. It's been moved by uh, Council Member Lopez Taft, second by Council Member Middleton. Any uh, questions or comments about the agenda? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you very much. Next item, please. The next item is presentation number four proclamation of the City of Citrus Heights proclaiming April 14th through 20th, 2024 as National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week. Thank you very much. I've asked uh, Council Member uh, Schaefer to go ahead and handle this uh, presentation. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to invite um, uh, Police Services uh, Supervisor Deborah Miller and um, Officer Ruben Hernandez and Tawny Feener, Officer Tawny Feener, and Alex Wager uh, to the podium to accept the proclamation, I'm, please. I'm sorry, Council Member Schaefer. I think that those that's for the next one, the animal control. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, oh, I, did I do that? No. I got, okay. No. So. Sorry about that. You, you got this is Regina proclamation you got Regina for national. But this says. But okay. this is proclamation for national safety. Yeah, we have representatives from the police department. I'll invite them to come to the podium. Okay. And they'll All right. We do that. They just introduce themselves. All right. Very good. <laughs> Here we go. So you're doing this. This is you, right? No, this is going to be you, Tim. Okay. Just some confusion. They, I they got the slide. This oh, is I see. Right. Okay. All right. This okay. Right. Well, very good. Nice to meet you all. Nice to meet you as well. Um, so, proclamation of the city of uh, Citrus Heights, proclaiming April 14th to 20th, 2024, National Public Safety Tele Telecommunications Week. Whereas the city of Citrus Heights, Citrus Heights Police Department Communications Center answers 911 calls during all hours for those in need of emergency services and public safety communications is uh, the dispatch center with committed, are, are committed to providing high quality and prompt response for protection of life and property and the dispatch team uh, are the link between the calling, uh, people calling for help in the situation and emergency response agencies who arrive on the scene and the 911 communications continue to offer compassionate service while setting the tone for responders, data, data mining for intelligence, and orchestrating the elements of the response. Whereas uh, the safety of those on both sides of the call is preserved by the accuracy of information obtained from those who contact Citrus Heights Police Dispatch Center. Whereas these 911 communicators, by their distinctive service, and dedicated efforts as professionals have earned our highest respect and deepest gratitude. 
and now therefore be resolved that the City Council of the City of Citrus Heights does hereby declare the week of April 14th through April 20th as National Public Safety Communications Week in honor of this group, of this work group, those skillful and critical functions uh, help keep our officers and the city safe. I just want to make a comment on this. I, 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 I am, I worship you guys. Uh, the, the, the level of professionalism, and I've been on the other end of the 911 call, um, it is really, truly remarkable job that you guys do. So thank you very much. Thank you. So. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to have you uh, make some comments if you like, and then we may make some comments, and then we'll come down and, and, and do a picture and all of that. So go ahead. Perfect. Good evening, Mayor Daniels, Vice Mayor Kropinski Costa, and the other members of the council. Thank you for taking the time to recognize this group of professionals tonight. My name is Regina Harmon, and I'm one of the communications supervisors over at Citrus Heights Police Department, and I have the distinct pleasure in overseeing our communications center. Every year during the second week of April, the telecommunications personnel in the public safety community are honored. This week-long event, initially set up in 1981, by Patricia Anderson of the Contra Costa County Sheriff's Office in California is a time to celebrate and thank those who dedicate their lives to serving the public. A week that we encourage be set aside to recognize the sacrifices that these team members make to create a better and safer response for those on both sides of the call, the public whom they talk to during their time of great need, and the responders who rely on them for accurate guidance and information. We appreciate the council giving the Citrus Heights Police Dispatch Team recognition through the proclamation. Today we have with us Dispatcher Stephanie. She is one of our six trainees who are just starting out with the profession. We would also like to share that next week, Chief Turcott will be presenting Dispatcher Sandy CHPD's 2024 Dispatcher of the Year Award. Not only is she this year's recipient, but she just recently celebrated her 30th year in law enforcement. We are truly proud of her and our entire dedicated team. Thank you. Yeah, so let me, let me just say uh, again what, what Council Member Schaefer uh, alluded to that um, thank you so much. Um, there is no harder job in law enforcement. There is no more stressful job in law enforcement. And there's probably no other uh, more important job in law enforcement. Because if it doesn't happen right at the dispatch center, it doesn't happen right in the field. And so um, what you do and what you bring to the community first uh, is incredible that you have to take these calls that come in from people that are in incredible stress um, and try to make logic out of it and send somebody there to help them. And then at the same time, the protection that you provide to the officers uh, as they arrive and, and work scenes. Um, it, it's, just, uh, it's just incredible. And so um, thank you so much for what you guys do and uh, keep doing it. And if you're new, keep doing it. And if you've been here for 30 years, keep doing it because it's critically important. Okay, we're gonna come down and take a picture. Thank you. Next slide, please. Our next item is presentation number five, a proclamation of the City of Citrus Heights proclaiming April 14th through 20th, 2024 as National Animal Care and Control Appreciation Week. All right. I've asked, no, I got this. Uh, I've, uh, come on. There we go. Okay, I've asked uh, uh, Vice Mayor Karpinski-Costa to do this presentation. 
I believe we have Supervisor Deborah Miller to say a few words later, and Officer Ruben Hernandez, and Tony Fleener, all our favorite people, and Alexis Wager to the podium. Thank you. I love doing this one. We also have Did our I new somebody? PA, Becca Henton. Say again, name? That's our new program assistant, Becca Henton. Welcome. Whereas the National Animal Care and Control Association has designated the second week of April each year as the Animal Control Officer Appreciation Week, and whereas Animal Services <coughs> excuse me, officers provide essential community functions, including the enhancement of animal control laws, protecting the public from diseases such as rabies, and educating the public on the proper care of the community's pets. And whereas the animal service officers are dedicated and highly qualified professionals who share the goals of preventing animal abuse and neglect, keeping the public safe from dangerous animals, rescuing injured animals, reuniting lost animals with their owners, and abating neighborhood nu nuisance issues, and more. Whereas Animal Services is highly productive in their service to our community, including community outreach events, emphasizing the importance of remaining current on vaccinations and regular checkups to maintain their health and importance of licensing your pets, as well as <coughs> or neutering your pets to reduce overpopulation. And whereas Animal Services officers often have a highly visible role in the communities they serve, and regularly interact with the public and enforce a variety of federal, state, county, and local laws in their capacity. And whereas the city of Citrus Heights wants to recognize and honor the animal service officers in our community and acknowledge their commitment to providing the highest and most efficient level of customer service and finding solutions to concerns regarding animals. Now therefore be it resolved that the city of Citrus Heights, the city council, of the City of Citrus Heights does hereby proclaim the second week of April as National Animal Care and Control Appreciation Week and do hereby urge all citizens of our community to join in recognizing and expressing their appreciation for the dedicated individuals who serve as our animal control officers. Done? Right, now they get to say a few words. <laughs> all right, uh, go ahead and then uh, we'll have a few words for you and then take a picture. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Daniels, Vice Mayor Dr. Karpinski Costa, and members of council. I am Deborah Nathan, Police Services Supervisor for Animal Services, Code Enforcement, and Rental Housing. On behalf of Chief Turcott, Commander Fry, and Manager Campbell, we are here this evening to celebrate a fantastic team. This week, we recognize the invaluable contributions of those who work tirelessly to protect and care for our beloved animal companions and safeguard our communities from potential threats. Our animal services officers are advocates, not just for animals, but also for our community. They provide education, resources, and support to pet owners, community members, and local organizations. They champion responsible pet ownership, investigate animal cruelty and neglect, and ensure humane treatment of all creatures, great and small, making our community safer. I would like to introduce you to this amazing team tonight that we have on hand. We have Senior Officer Ruben Hernandez, ASO Tony Fleener, and Alexis Wager is actually in Disneyland, so she could not join us tonight. And I want to, it's the happiest place on earth. I guess it's not city council, <laughs> strange. We have our new program assistant, Becca Henton. She joined us in February and we're super ecstatic to have her a part of the team. So to our animal services officers, we commend your unwavering compassion, courage, and commitment to the welfare of animals and the safety of our communities. Your relentless efforts make a profound difference in the lives of animals and people, and we are deeply grateful for your service. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any comments? I do. Go ahead, Jane. I know was one thing I didn't remember reading in the proclamation was the word compassion. And I, I'm going to start tearing up because I know from my relationship with um, her, Mr. Hernandez that the compassion is a big, giant part of what you do. You aren't just out there policing pets, you know. And so um, I appreciate 
that our city has such a great team and that we recognize you across the, you know, across the whole nation. I guess this is National Animal Services Control Week and it's appreciative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tim, anything? Okay. Yeah, I'll just say that um, thank you for what you do. Um, I, I don't know how you do it, actually. <laughs> um, uh, you know, when you're known by your first name and you're, you're in something like you guys are, uh, you know you're doing a good job. So people know throughout the city, uh, uh, Ruben and Tony. So uh, that's a good thing. That's a really good sign. Um, yeah, I spent 20 years in law enforcement, and I'd rather take on a person any day uh, than a chihuahua even. <laughs> so um, I don't know how you do it. I really don't know how you do it. And so thank you for what you do. It's so critical to the city. Um, it's becoming more and more important, uh, or at least, uh, not more and more important, but um, more and more of a focus for the city too. So uh, I know resources can be thin at times, so hang in there and I think you're gonna see uh, even better things uh, for that division as we go along. So thank you very much. We're gonna come down and take a picture and go from there. Next item, please. Next item is public comment, and if you wish to address the council oh, no, during no, no, the meeting. No, no, no. Oh, one more Wait a minute. Somebody oh. mark the calendar. I'm so Amy sorry. Amy made a mistake. I I'm cannot sorry. read it. <laughs> mark your calendars. This yes, is a you once are a decade thing. Yes, I apologize. I skipped one. So we have a proclamation, uh, presentation number six. Proclamation of the City of Citrus Heights, acknowledging distinguished service medal recipient, police officer Joseph Keller. Thank you. I'd like to uh, invite up police officer Joseph Keller to the platform. Good evening. Good evening. I'm going to go ahead and read this proclamation, and uh, then we'll have some kind words for you, I'm sure. So. Uh, whereas on May 23rd, 2022, the Citrus Heights Police Department responded to reports of a shooting with a person lying on the ground. Upon arriving on the scene, Officer Keller led a team of Citrus Heights Police Department officers and Sacramento County Sheriff deputies to stage and prepare for entry into the affected apartment after officers received word that a child and a second gunshot wound victim were inside. The team approached the location and quickly rescued a two-year-old child who appeared to be emotionally upset. The child was quickly escorted away and reunited with his mother who was waiting close by. Continuing their search of the apartment, officers located the second victim and attempted life-saving measures. However, the victim had already succumbed to gunshot wounds. And whereas Officer Keller, without knowing if an armed subject would be lying in wait, constructed a sensible working plan and coordinated efforts with his teammates to safely rescue a traumatized child from a violent situation, and whereas his ability to remain calm and professional and perform well in a stressful situation involving the threat of imminent danger to himself or others by using exceptional tactics and judgment, police officer Joseph Keller was awarded the Distinguished Service Medal. And whereas the city of Citrus Heights wants to recognize and honor police officer Joseph Keller upon his receipt of the Distinguished Service Medal and acknowledge his 
excuse me, and acknowledge his commendable acts of service as well as his commitment to the safety of the citizens of the city of Citrus Heights. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the city council of the city of Citrus Heights does hereby recognize and honor police officer Joseph Keller and urges all Citrus Heights community members to join in recognizing him and expressing their appreciation for the dedicated individuals who serve as police officers within our community. Thank you very much. If you want to take a minute to say anything, no. Oh no, you don't. You don't know the chief. He's not going to let you walk away like that. No. Um, mayor, members of council, I tell you, as the chief of police, Alex Turcott. There's my introduction. Um, as chief of police, I cannot be more proud of the men and women that serve in this community. They dedicate their lives to do heroic actions every day um, that really make a difference in how this city looks, feels, but then the overall safety to be able to be as safe as possible out there in the community. <clears throat> Part of the reason why Officer Keller feels a little disinclined to speak right now is uh, most of our staff, they hate this part of the recognition. Um, they're quiet professionals who really are dedicated to make people's lives better. They don't do it for applause. They don't do it for accolades. They do it because it's the right thing to do. Officer Keller's worked in this uh, city for the better part of a decade. He took a quick hiatus to serve a neighboring community, but then we welcomed him back home just recently last week. This incident occurred before he left us the first time, and while we were able to get him his award, we really wanted to do right and publicly acknowledge the service that not only he, but his team committed on that night. So thank you so much for the recognition. Officer Joe Keller, thank you so much for your work and your service to the community. Councilmember Middleton, anything? Thank you so much. As a mother of two um, in the city, to see someone have so much compassion, quick action, quick thinking, uh, leading your team the way you did. I heard this, um, this whole announcement uh, at the swearing-in ceremony uh, for the officers, and hearing it again still pulls my heartstrings because I understand that this is a very stressful job, and to be able to do it and do it to near perfection the way you did. I mean, we couldn't ask for better in the city, and I hope that we see you all the way through. You stay with us to retirement. Congratulations and thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Council Member Schaefer. Uh, I, just, I just want to commend you. Uh, thank you very much for, for what you did. I know that um, in my own life, uh, I had a situation where uh, I had to think about my duty before my own safety. And I think that's what you were doing. You were thinking about protecting. This is what you're sworn to do. And I just want to tell you that I, I appreciate the fact that you back that up with your own courage. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my words are thank you for taking action. Thank you for doing something. Thank you for not just sitting there and um, waiting and waiting and waiting for something. And so um, uh, it's commendable. It's not taken lightly at all. Um, and I wish people understood the level. But uh, thank you for doing something and taking care of it. We're going to come down and take a picture. And welcome back, prodigal yes. son.
Please. Next item, please. Next item is public comment. And if you wish to address the council during the meeting, please fill out a speaker identification sheet and give it to myself. Members of the public are normally speakers are limited to five minutes each. The mayor has the discretion to reduce the allotted time. We have a countdown display of the allotted time and it will flash red at the end of the allotted time. Also consistent with the Brown Act, the council is prohibited from engaging in a discussion or taking action on any item not appearing on the agenda. And um, mayor, in addition to uh, some of the public comment tonight, I do have two um, written public comment that I'll read at the conclusion of the, um, for this section of the uh, public comment period. Very good, I'll call up uh, Sherry Merrick. Hello, Mayor Daniels, Vice Mayor Karpinski-Costa, and fellow council members. I just wanted to come and introduce myself to the community of Citrus Heights. I have the pleasure of serving as the new executive director of the Citrus Heights Chamber of Commerce. And I want to thank all of the council as well as the city for their support of our recent awards, um, community awards dinner. We had a wonderful event. We were able to acknowledge some upstanding citizens and business owners in our community, and we couldn't have done it without your support. So I just wanted to come and say thank you so much for your support. Thank you very much. You're okay. welcome. I'm on back again. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Next up, Natalie Price. Hello, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members city staff, and neighbors. It is I, Natalie Price, here to represent the Sylvan Old Auburn Road Neighborhood Association tonight. I get to do something that I love to do, which is brag about community. Council and the city really invests in our neighborhood. Some of you offer your own personal time and sacrifices. I know I've worked with all of you in some capacity out here, and for that I'm very grateful. When you invest in the neighborhoods, it gives us an opportunity to invest back into our community, and that's fun. I was hoping tonight to pass this giant bag of, oh, look at that, I do. How exciting. Um, <laughs> We have neighborhood gifts, right? We learn this in our community workshop. And some of those gifts come in the form of humans, of good people who give back. And Alfred Sanchez, our neighborhood snack man, is one of those individuals in the city who looks for ways to give back. He helps our unhoused population, and hence the name Snack Man. But it's not just snacks he gives. For his birthday, he collects donations of socks to give to the unhoused. And our neighborhood, SOAR, voted as a board to support his efforts with uh, 199 pairs of socks, almost 200. Alfred, I saw you come uh, up, friend. Come on up, come get your socks, buddy. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Some of the other things we do, we fundraise. At the corner of Greenback and Sunrise, you are going to notice on June 28th through July 4th that there is a fireworks booth right there. That is run by my neighborhood association, Sylvan Old Auburn Road. And what we do with that money is, once again, give back. And part of that was in a collaboration with Meals on Wheels, who several times a year identify seniors with a little bit extra of a need. And I'm very fortunate fortunate to go out with my friend Dr. Jaina Karpinski-Costa and uh, bless some people in our community. I have for today prepared a short PowerPoint which will save my voice, but I would like to show you the sore serve seniors with our spring bounty. Thank you. Peter Cottontail Hopping down the bunny trail Hippity-hoppity Easter's on its way Bringing every girl and boy Baskets full of 
Easter joy. Things to make your Easter bright and gay. He's got jelly beans for Tommy, colored eggs for Sister Sue. There's an orchid for your mommy and an Easter bonnet too. Oh, here comes Peter Cottontail. Stop and listen to him say Try to do the things you should Maybe if you're extra good He'll roll lots of Easter eggs your way You'll wake up on Easter morning And you'll know that he was there When you find those chocolate Bunnies that he's hiding everywhere. Oh, here comes Peter Cottontail, hopping down the bunny trail. Hippity hoppity happy Easter day. Nice. <laughs> that is what we do. It's more than just the fresh produce that hit their table that day. It's the relationships that we build. It's the time that we spend. It's finding out that somebody is pre-diabetic and can't afford a glucose monitor and circling back to take care of that need. It's finding out that our senior citizens are being hit with large bills at the end of a 911 call where they're just looking to get assistance. So they're choosing not to call for help and opening a dialogue with our city manager. These are the things the community does. So thank you all for your assistance. Thank you very much, Natalie. <laughs> Next up is Scott Smith. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and City Council. Uh, a little background, I've lived in Citrus Heights for, I think, 19 years now, going in 19 years. And what got me here was the Education Committee when they presented the report a few weeks ago. Now, I'm somewhat embarrassed to say it's my first time <laughs> to a City Council meeting. I have to admit that, first of all. And I'm not a product of Citrus Heights schools. I don't have any kids in school here and never have. But I was kind of fired up after that last meeting with the Education Committee, because I actually expected like a crisis commitment. Like, wow, this is as bad, if not worse, than you kind of hear around town. Because again, I didn't have any kids in school. But I've had neighbors say things over the years. When we uh, moved here in 20, 2005, that was something you thought of when you, you know, for home values, how the future is going to be, you know, where's the, the city going to go? I, I expected like a crisis commitment, like we got to do something about this. And at the end, it was like, oh, we'll have more dialogue with San Juan. And I'm not here to beat up San Juan Unified. It's just a massive district, probably what top 10 or 15 in the state. And I don't know how often the superintendents over the years have been here. I'm kind of guessing that may have been the first time or one of a few times. That's just not, they don't represent us, Citrus Heights. So they don't have that commitment, and they can't be bopping around to all these different communities. And if, I, if I'm right, Citrus Heights may be the only city in the San Juan School District, outside, of course, of Sacramento. So it's very unique. And so was it January 1997 that Citrus Heights was incorporated? It seems like we need more courage. <laughs> we got to step it up. One of the great things about this city is, just as we saw in the beginning, we have a police department. That's a big deal. But when it comes to priorities for a community, you know, safety, education, you know, quality of life, there's like no commitment here for the education. It's been like put off like San Juan's babysitting our kids. And how well, not our kids, but the kids of the community. And how well has that worked out? 
they're all getting basically an F grade. Now, all those numbers we saw a few weeks ago was like number overload and really, to be frank, unnecessary. All it did was confirm what everybody pretty much knows. So to me, that's why I expected more of a, all right, what are we going to do? What concrete steps are we going to do? And I commend the, the two of you who voted to go forward. But three shocked me by saying, nope, we'll just keep continuing to engage, whatever that means. There was nothing concrete. If something is failing you for decades, what does further dialogue do? And it was pointed out that all the different turnover, nothing has changed. And I'm not sure if it got worse over the last 20 years or so, or better, but if we had every restaurant in Citrus Heights getting F grades, like in health evaluations, we wouldn't say, well, let's continue dialogue with the health department. We wouldn't eat there, they would just close. But here we're, we're like, improperly or unfairly propping them up. And the numbers are mentioned, I haven't had a chance to verify this, but I think Mayor Daniels, you said something about, like a back envelope number was 20,000 per student is what the state provides each student annually or something like that. That's 260 million a year, <laughs> I think if the math is right. That means in about four years, that's four years, that's a billion friggin' dollars that we let go to somebody else, to another agency. How is that not, our, we have basically buying power, I'm trying to be quick here. So that's why I was like, what, what's going on here? Nothing, it's not working. So since we're running out of time here, I thought this city needs to step up and get more courageous, step it up, and at least keep on the, the uh, table to do something changes. And we have an economic director, coordinator. Why not an educational director who's on staff at a minimum, so they can keep updating and then meet with San Juan Unified School District and get input. We have no boots in the ground. We have no local control. And several years ago, about 30 years ago, I was being recruited by the city of Stockton <coughs> to help them with meetings and hotel business. I was in, in the Bay Area at the time. And I had to give the guy a very candid answer. I had to turn him down. I said, at that point, I think there was like the murder capital of the world was Stockton. And I wasn't trying to say disparaging things, but I had to tell the guy, I have to decline. I can't in good faith call businesses and uh, organizations across the country to bring you here until you fix your city. And you have to do that first. And that's why families are not moving here. Thank you, Scott, yeah. for your words. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you, for, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. What you guys do? That is all the uh, comment sheets I have for public comment at this time. I believe we're going to Read a few? Yes, I do have a few to read, and then I believe one more that um, we need to switch out of the stack and pull up to the front uh, for Kelsey, if you have that one. For now? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think it was under Come on up, Kelsey. 12. Good evening, Mayor Daniels and Vice Mayor Karpinski Costa and Council. Thank you for reordering the speakers and allowing me to speak now. Um, given that the conference is coming up again soon, I wanted to give a recap of my attendance of NUSA last year, which is the Neighborhood USA Conference. Um, I went along with a couple other residents from Citrus Heights, uh, Natalie Price and Gigi Rayford, as well as uh, city staff, Courtney Riddle. And throughout the multiple days of presentations, forums, workshops, and tours, I had the privilege of meeting neighborhood leaders and city staff from all over the US and as far as the Bahamas, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, topics of the educational sessions ranged from planning effective neighborhood meetings to neighborhood vigilance uh, to the benefits of management districts. And out of all of that, what I found the most useful was um, both a session called placemaking, planning the future with historical assets, uh, which was presented by city officials from the town of San Alisario, Texas. Um, and then, as well, a tour of the local missions led by the same group. So their focus was really about the history um, of their area, and the conference was held in El Paso, Texas. Um, so 
this experience inspired me to look for ways to honor the history of our city. And fortunately, I was recently given a copy of the book Becoming the City of Citrus Heights uh, by Miranda Culp and Bill Van Duker. And it's been pretty interesting to read about how we achieved our cityhood. Um, so I'm looking forward to digging into that further and then the rest of the history of our area. Um, our neighborhood, Area 3, who I represented there at the conference chant, has been talking in the past several months about how we can celebrate our history. And one member in particular, Andrew Saunders, has been working to memorialize the stretch of the historic Lincoln Highway that runs through our city. And um, it sounds like they're going to be installing signposts that are branded to the Lincoln Highway. Um, so he'll, I think, be speaking with you more about that pretty soon here. Um, at our most recent meeting, which was earlier this week, the group talked about incorporating old photographs of our part of the Lincoln Highway into mural art on our sound walls. Um, so it's convenient that the city is doing a lot with the sound walls and uh, potentially murals. Um, in that continued effort of placemaking that came from Noosa, um, we'd also love to bring more artwork into the area around the intersection of Auburn Boulevard and Greenback Lane. Uh, it's the most major intersection near our neighborhood area in the southwest corner of our city. So it'd be a great spot if we can find uh, the exact placement for it. Um, so overall, attending Noosa was a fantastic experience. And uh, through the melding of minds over those few days in El Paso, I became more inspired and more confident in being a part of improving the engagement and resilience of our little city. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, Amy, you have a couple of ones that you're going to read? Yes, that is correct. I have two that I will read. The first one is from Dan DeVries. Um, this is regarding permit fees. I have been waiting for the city building department to answer a question. I noticed that there was a meeting tonight and thought I would ask the folks in charge as to why the city is estimating my project at more than twice the actual value of the project. Therefore, my permit cost have more than doubled coincidence. I have a feeling I won't have the opportunity to ask. Um, and i just like to note that we have shared this with um, staff on okay. um, the individual's contact. The next public comment card is for agenda item 11, which is on the consent regarding the intention to renew the Sunrise Marketplace. And this is from Rick Hodgkins, and he states, I can't help wonder if we are to bring in some stores that are perhaps in other parts of Sacramento County, say like Winco Foods, as well as perhaps Whole Foods to compete with our existing line of grocery stores, just like Bel Air, Raley's, which we have down on Antelope Road and Lycan Drive. Plus we have two Walmarts, Neighborhood Market and a Super Center. Plus we have a Food Max. We also have two vacant grocery store sites, one across the street from the Sunrise Mall, and another vacant grocery store site across the street from Safeway on Greenback and San Juan. Actually, it's diagonally across or Kitty Corner. Plus we ought to bring in a kitchen supply store, either a Chef's Toys, which I think is called, as there is one location down on Richard Boulevard or Williams Sonoma, as there are only two of those different locations, one in Loman Plaza in Sacramento, another one on Gallery of a Boulevard in Roseville. Remember, if Sunrise Mall goes, I go. Thank you. And that concludes the written public comment for this section of the agenda. Right, thank you very much. Next item, please. Next item is comments by council members and regional board updates. Council Member Middleton. Okay, I think I'm ready. <laughs> um, let's see, 328 we had our strategic planning session which was very robust and um, I believe we have some information that's on our website that kind of shows you what our, our focus area work plan, our FWAP, is uh, for the next um, year and there beyond. Um, also, later that evening after that, we, um, most of our council went over to um, El Tapatio to see um, the new uh, Woman of the Year appointed by Assemblymember Josh Hoover, and that just so happens to be our Executive Director for the Citrus Heights Chamber, so congratulations again. Um, then there was the Kiwanis Easter egg hunt that happened in Rush Park that got rained out. We turned it into a drive through We still had the Easter bunnies, the donuts, coffee. The kids were very happy, and it was just a really great time for us to be engaged with our community. Um, I also hosted our Sacramento Valley Division meeting for Cal Cities. I'm the president of the division. 
here. So I represent um, 58 cities um, in, from here all the way up to the Oregon border. And we just talked about what's coming up next. Our next meeting, um, group meeting outing is gonna be in Lake Shasta and we're gonna talk about housing. And um, more, more importantly, affordable housing that is um, uh, ADUs, which uh, Citrus Heights was a little bit about because we have our own little pre-done ADU plans. And so if you're looking to do that in Citrus Heights, we've already got the, the roadmap done. Uh, on the fourth, I attended the Citrus Heights Police Department Oath of Office. We had a huge number of officers being sworn in or being promoted. It was amazing to watch and see and just to see our department continue to grow, to, to continue to see the dedication of the individuals here in our police department. So congratulations, Chief, on a job well done. Um, I am also met with Kevin Hutz, Huntzinger from Sunrise Parks, and we talked about different ways that we can kind of expand Sunrise Parks and Rec and bring more programming that is um, more engaging to our, our, our ever-evolving and changing family landscape here in the community. And I also had a very interesting conversation with a local, um, organization that does pop-up shops. Uh, you might have noticed about those in Arden Mall where they had the pop-up shops right before COVID and it allows uh, small entrepreneurs who cannot afford to have business space inside of a mall to have an area where they can come, talk to the local community about their product, learn what, what sells, what doesn't and why, and then eventually branch off into like a kiosk or a small store within the, um, within the mall area. This individual is actually working with our city team and with um, Ethan Conrad who owns the Sears area to see if they could bring something like that to Citrus Heights into our mall to help kind of reactivate that space. And those are my comments. Thank you very much, Council Member Lopez Tapp. All right, similar activities as Council Member uh, Middleton attended strategic planning and you know I'm always excited I started attending st strategic planning days um, before I got on council and it's always so exciting to hear what the council has planned or what they're considering planning and so um, I would encourage you if you ever have that a little bit of time free come and witness what what is being planned for the future you know you get to have public comment at that location as well and you know you never know how much you can influence your your city government until you go out and, and do so so um, very good day there um, celebrated Sherry Merrick as well as the woman of the year I attended um, the cannabis workshop, very interesting, just to hear not only the presentation, but the care and consideration on both sides of the argument. And so I appreciate everyone who participated in that. I know we're gonna have lots more comments um, in a similar vein, and we have been um, fielding several comments since. So thank you all again for participating in the process. This is very important for all of us who represent you to hear your voices. And finally, I also had my own separate meeting with our new um, exec at Sunrise Park and Rec, Kevin Hunsinger. Uh, very nice to, to get to know all of our new staff. We have a fresh, excited group of people coming to lead various aspects of the city, and Kevin is also one of them. And what I'm very excited is he is considering youth leadership programs. So we were talking about education earlier. This is another part of that. You know, how do we uplift our youth by providing other opportunities for them to shine and learn uh, the next level of leadership and management skills? So very excited to work with him on that um, in the future. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. Council Member Schaefer. Thank you very much, Mayor. Been very busy. Um, prior to our strategic planning, so I, there's no uh, m sort of venue for this type of uh, information. Um, I toured uh, with, I sit on SACOG, that's Sacramento Area Council of Government. <coughs> um, we had a sort of a field trip and we went over to Woodland. Uh, lots of really cool things happening in Woodland. Um, it's, a, it's a city of 62,000 people. Um, it's bigger than I thought it was. Uh, they have some pretty innovative programs there. Um, they have um, a, a laboratory called Ag Start there. It was very interesting um, that uh, this is a business incubator for, um, for farming and for development. The Rayleigh's is a sponsor of this. Uh, they call it, a, um, a, like I said, a business in incubator. So that's where Rayleigh's can go and 
develop new recipes for uh, their stores and they can get all the analysis and find out what the calorie content is and what all the all the required reporting information. Uh, this is a it's a really really impressive facility um, and a lot of the UC Davis folks uh, work in there and it, it is like I said it's just a really impressive facility but we've got a tour of wood of woodland and um, and there's a lot of really cool things going on in woodland um, so with that I, then this following Monday uh, I had a follow-up uh, meeting I sit on the um, uh, policy and innovation committee there and we had a financial update and it's not looking pretty they have to pull down they're going to be pulling pulled uh, 2.8 million dollars from reserves um, so while I don't know if this is anything to get super excited about right now but it could be there was lots of discussion there it's potentially what we're looking at over the next three or four years where things aren't going to may not be as um, as good as they've been so um, so it, it's a, that's a that's a pretty big concern so I also um, there's a uh, I am Brown acted with um, with dr. Jane Carpinski Costa on the um, the marijuana issue and so we did went and toured some facilities uh, some of the dispensaries we went and toured the sanctuary um, I saw somebody's comment here that they thought it was a filthy, dirty. Well, that's not that I, that, that wasn't the experience that I had to be <laughs> there. It's very clean. Um, then we actually toured North County Farms, which is a producer. Um, it was, I used to work for Wrigley's Gum. And what, as I walked through that facility, it's amazing how absolutely clean that is, that entire facility, how high tech it is. It's pretty impressive. It's not your, um, it's it's not your, you know, just a regular indoor grow. It is very very high tech and very sophisticated uh, process. And I see that um, Benny Gardner is here in the audience. I appreciate that he uh, he hosted our tour there. Like I said, very impressive. Now, uh, and and we're going to move on to talk more about that. But that was something uh, that. That was like I said. It was really, a, really an interesting thing. We are certainly educating ourselves on this issue. Um, so, anyhow, that's all I have. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Vice Mayor Karpinski Costa. Thank you, Mayor Daniels. So, last so the last council meeting was our retreat. So we go back to before that council meeting, up to that council meeting, because I did things those two weeks too, and so we do. All the vice mayors in the county have lunch. And so I went to a vice mayor, all the vice mayors, it's kind of cool, have lunch. And so this time was hosted by Sacramento City Vice Mayor Katie Maple. So that was kind of fun. And it's my turn to host the next one. And I got to get it organized. But we tested out India Oven on our Greenback Lane as our restaurant of choice to host the next vice mayor lunch. So then we, Natalie and I did the spring bounty and I need to cut eyeballs so the chicken face to come down because otherwise I can't see where I'm going. So she, I'm the spring chicken and she's the bunny rabbit and we bring fresh vegetables and fruits and some other little items to our seniors, follow up for our Christmas when, when she's my elf and I'm Santa and we deliver food at Christmas as well. So we love our people. We get to see them year after year and little dog Ginger has been around for a while. Ginger must be ancient. Then I went to a mosquito meeting, and right now, or at least that, at that meeting, um, mosquitoes are still in diapause for the winter. You might see those big ones flying around. Those are, do not carry West Nile, the big ones. They do carry malaria, but we don't have malaria here, so not to worry. And, but I do want to remind people to put their dogs on heartworm, medic on heartworm prevention because that's a spring mosquito that lives in the trees, and we want to make sure our dogs don't get sick. And then the same day I had, I was the speaker for Sue Frost's community meeting and I appreciate the people who attended. I appreciate Sue Frost for reaching out to her community. She's done a wonderful job with that, reaching out and communicating with all of us. And I do appreciate, I don't know, we'll, I hope that continues with our new supervisor, but we'll see. Then I attended a Girl Scout event during recognition of Women's Month. Um, and a lot of the, I thought it was going to be all little girls in green selling cookies, but it was a lot of um, professional women who were Girl Scouts in their youth, 
and how good and successful they have become. Uh, Kitty O'Neill was a Girl Scout. Um, Mrs. Comstock, the lady that runs the Comstock magazine, was there. And so I was so honored to be around. I think Mary Jane was there with me, so um, it was honored to be there. And we brought them a little city uh, recognition, and they were pleased to punch to get that. Then we went to the community awards dinner with the, with the chamber. That was fun. And, you know, when item 14 comes up and people are asking for compensation, additional compensation for this council, <coughs> um, no matter how the vote goes, you see that we go to just more than this meeting. We do attend uh, community meetings. We attend our, uh, what do you call them, quality of life meeting I'm on or finance committee meeting or chamber two by twos or whatever the, the meetings are, we go to those. But then the fun part was the crab feed for the Crime Stoppers. Thank you, Chief Turcott, for inviting me. And then we had a SOAR meeting. And then we had our meeting with Hunsinger at the park. He's reaching out to meet with all the council members. And so we talked about our concerns. Our neighborhood has a section of Arcade Creek Park that we funded with our fireworks money to put in a trail that's in the trail for the blind. And so there's a rope tour that you can take, then we call it our sensory tail, trail. And then this year we want to add a small raised garden with uh, aromatic plants and things that have tactile stuff to it. And then I went to a sewer meeting. What's happening at the sewer? Uh, we are increasing our rates and there were community meetings on the sewer, poorly attended, like 10 people in five jurisdictions came and Citrus Heights had the most with four people at it. So um, uh, pretty sad, but then we did get like 53 protests. So more people protested than cared about why the increase. Um, well then, with the, the marching band had a spaghetti dinner and to raise some funds the night before Easter, but it was well attended and Bill Cook did fine in his surgery, so he was there. That was fun to see him. Uh, then I did take a tour of the sanctuary with um, uh, Council Member Schaefer, and it was eye-opening. Uh, 85 employees, one guy that lives in Citrus Heights, I met him. Uh, went to the public meeting on cannabis and do want to you know, thank the people who participated. I think some of the questions weren't all answered, so we, we're still asking the questions and getting answers. And uh, another sewer meeting another quality of life meeting, and just on Monday, I will be taking the mayor's place as Monday with the mayor, so if you wanna come and complain or whatever, thank us for the good work we do, we'll be there Monday between nine and 12 at City Hall. All right, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for keeping comments uh, short tonight, folks. Uh, I know we got a <laughs> lot of people that are gonna be speaking a little later, so we wanna get to them. I'm not going to uh, rehash any uh, things about what's been going on. Uh, my council members noted a lot of events that we attended, and so I'll wait till our next meeting to catch up on everything else. So with that, next item, please. Next item is the consent calendar, items 7 through 11, and I'm just going to turn it over to the city attorney for a brief statement. Yes, just with regard regarding item number 9, the government code does require me to state that before you vote on that item, it is a proposed one-time $20,000 non purgeable payment to the city manager. And it is not required to be pulled from the consent agenda. Just wanted you to make be aware of that. Thank you much. Any uh, uh, motion on the? Uh, uh, anybody want any of the items pulled from the consent calendar? Okay, not hearing that. I'll hear take a motion on it. Move approval. Second. It's been moved by Council Member Schaefer and seconded by Council Member Middleton. Uh, anybody have any questions or comments about the motion? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Passes. Next item, please. Next item is regular calendar, item number 13. The subject is Cannabis Dispensary Outreach Update and Council Direction. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council, Casey Campanari, Community Development Director here with uh, Director Huber, our Economic Development and Community Engagement Director, um, to uh, share with you the results of the community engagement that we've had on the cannabis discussion over the last uh, month or so. So tonight we're going to give a brief background on, on kind of the history. Um, we'll share the outreach results with the council and then we'll also seek direction from the council as to the next steps to take. 
So just a little long-term background, before we became a city in 1986, uh, Prop 215 was passed in the state that allowed medicinal uh, marijuana use. Uh, more recently, in 2016, um, Prop 64 was passed by uh, California voters, 52% um, in favor here in Citrus Heights and 48% against. Um, more recently, um, the two members of the council asked uh, the staff to bring back um, options to consider cannabis in the future. Um, so on February 8th, we did a, a pretty robust presentation uh, uh, and got some feedback from the, the council. Um, and the council directed us to do additional outreach to and report back to the council. So that's why we're here tonight. Um, in February, we had our flash road open, and Director Huber will talk more about that. Uh, we also had an online feedback form that was available for about a month, and then also a, a workshop that um, several of you mentioned and attended. So with that, I'll turn it over to Director Huber. Thanks, Casey. Uh, now we will take a few minutes to review the results of the outreach. Staff implemented a multi-channel outreach plan uh, using a variety of channels to ensure equity, inclusion, and access um, for folks to give feedback. The, these were three primary channels. First is flash vote, a tool that we use to gather community sentiment data. Second was a community workshop, and third is online feedback. So moving into the flash vote, uh, flash vote is a tool that we use. They are scientific surveys to collect statistically valid community input. The participation rates of the surveys combined with the fact that uh, users need to register using their residential address um, ensure that we are collecting statistically valid data. This survey in particular has a plus or minus 5% margin of error. The image on the right is a snip of what the email looks like. This is what registered users will receive to engage in a survey. So the flash vote to collect community sentiment data on cannabis uh, was four questions. It's a best practice to have five or less questions for this data. Um, the first question is, in general, do you support legalized cannabis for adult use? Uh, the results were 59% yes and 32% no. Question two was, please rate how much you would support having retail cannabis stores in Citrus Heights. Uh, this tabulated into 49% support versus 48 opposed, and that it's tabulated by adding the strongly and somewhat support or non-support for total percentage. Question three, if retail cannabis stores were allowed, where would be the best places to locate them in Citrus Heights? Uh, the highlighted bullets are the top takeaways from the answers to this question. 41% of those surveyed supported retail cannabis stores in any non-residential zone. 32% of those surveyed supported retail cannabis stores in only commercial centers directly adjacent to Interstate 80. Other options included Antelope Crossing Commercial Corridor, Auburn Boulevard Commercial Corridor, and Sunrise Boulevard Commercial Corridor. Question, uh, another way to look at question three is this slide. Uh, we received recommendation from our flash vote consultant on how to issue this particular survey. They've advised multiple cities, especially in the state of California, on gathering community sentiment data around cannabis. And the survey has uh, the ability to use the answer to question one, do you support legalized cannabis use as a filter to drill down deeper into remaining questions. So when we apply the support versus non-support data, we can look under the hood a little deeper to see what those answers look like by segment. This was specifically recommended by our flash vote consultant as a method to be able to identify areas of potential community consensus. The two main takeaways from looking at question three through the question one filter is 42% 
of non-supporters identified the best place to locate cannabis stores in commercial centers near the freeway, and 16% of non-supporters identified any non-residential zone, but not near schools or parks. So according to FlashVote, as a data collection expert, that would identify potential community consensus. Question four, should retail cannabis stores move forward? City staff may recommend a maximum of two licenses be made available. What restrictions would you support, if any? The three votes that rose to the top was uh, first, almost a two to one preference result on the option of two or less permits versus three or more permits. 36% of non-supporters in particular would support two permits or less. And then finally, there was a two and a half to one ratio in favor of collecting a tax. Moving on to the second segment of uh, community outreach, it was our community workshop hosted Wednesday, April 3rd. Uh, we had a great turnout of residents wanting to engage in conversation. I think in total, Casey, we counted about 60 attendees. Uh, and it was about an hour, staff gave a short presentation uh, of the um, potential conditions for retail cannabis sales allowance, along with initial staff recommendations that were presented in the first council presentation and associated staff report. There were two activities that attendees could engage in. Most importantly was the community feedback form. It was emphasized to attendees at multiple points along the way that this is how we would deliver their feedback uh, to council directly. So included in this staff report item uh, is an attachment with the total collection of raw data from these feedback form submissions. Uh, the card had three questions. One, please rate how much you would support having retail cannabis stores in Citrus Heights. Two, please provide any written comments on the feedback form. And uh, three, an action item to please make sure to submit your card. Uh, and we also um, were intentional about putting a box so folks could check if they were a resident to give us a better idea. I do want to acknowledge that that is a self-selection. The second activity at the workshop was meant to be an interactive visual where each attendee was given a sticker where they denoted on poster boards displayed at the front of the room their level of potential support or non-support. This is a summary of the community feedback from the workshop uh, as distilled from the feedback cards. The final category of uh, feedback channel is online feedback. This was a 24 seven option open to everyone to ensure inclusive and equitable opportunities to engage. Uh, we did get, Casey, how many responses did we get? I don't know if I see the number. Uh, we got a little over 20 responses from what we recall, and the project page was meant to be a one-stop of information and really highlight uh, the feedback form opportunity. So that uh, concludes our short presentation. Um, we're here to seek direction from council. We threw out four potential options, but of course uh, we're here to serve at your pleasure, so we'll take direction from you. Um, option one would be to kind of stick with the path that was outlined in February uh, staff report, um, which would move forward with, with the ordinance and, and associated actions. Option two would be to stop here and, and call it a day. Option three would be to um, first bring forward a tax measure for consideration and then follow up with the nuts and bolts of an ordinance if that measure should pass in November. And option four, of course, is any other approach identified by the council. So with that, um, Megan and I are here to answer any questions you may have. Okay, we have, a, uh, we have quite a few uh, public uh, speaker sheets, but first, any questions or comments regarding uh, the presentation? Jane? I do have a concern that was raised by one of my constituents, and they said that the online form was not open for a very long time, even the 24 hours, I think it was closed. Um, much sooner than than was presented so there may be a little bit of um confusion 
if anything else about the online form. I just want to bring that to your attention. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, start with the speaker sheets. Um, we do have quite a few. We were going to cut it down to three, but actually I don't have as many as I thought I would have, so I will stick with five, five minutes. Uh, please remember, uh, I have about, I think, 15 of them, or, oh no, excuse me, 14 of them. Um, uh, if you uh, agree with something somebody said earlier, you're more than welcome to say, I agree with the previous speaker. Um, you know, but again, you, the time is yours, but uh, the, um, uh, just uh, in consideration of the amount of speakers we have, please keep your comments short if you can, okay? Um, and with that, I'll start with uh, David Warren. Mayor. Yes, go ahead, I'm I, sorry. Can I just make, yeah. uh, we do five minutes times 14. That's a, we could be sitting here till. Well, it's, it's about an, I figured about an hour uh, when I thought about going to three, I thought we'd have more speakers. And so we'll stick with Mayor, five, I think, but okay. I have a feeling that. Uh, and Mayor, I just wanted to note, I do have eight uh, written public comments that I'll be reading as well. <coughs> okay, let's stick with five and hope for the best for now. Mr. Warren. Unlike the police officer, I'm not a person of few words. Um, I've submitted, uh, I hope, uh, that, uh, that you had an opportunity to review written comments. And the reason I'm here tonight is because I shared my written comments with a number of individuals, and they raised some points that I wish to add and emphasize. Number one, I view the opening of the cannabis uh, dispensaries as a public safety safeguard. If we have legal sales in the city that are competitive in price with illegal sales, we will force the illegal individuals out. The licensed cannabis dispensaries, we can control the quality of the product that's sold, and fentanyl seems to be being included in illegal cannabis sales, and that's a great danger to our community. Uh, if we can push the illegal sales out off our street corners, we will decrease the number of juveniles who have access to illegal sales. And that is a positive benefit which seems to be overlooked. I don't really care about the tax revenue. I can, I'm concerned about public safety. Second, I believe that the tax revenue that can be generated can add to public education and more importantly to public safety services so that that revenue can be used to further enforce uh, the prevention of illegal sales in our community, which is too <coughs> widespread. Next, I think that we're overlooking the simple reality. When I started my legal career, I was stuck on Saturday and Sunday nights every four weeks writing oral search warrants. I had the unfortunate experience of going to a home where a baby had been left in the bathtub and some individuals had been smoking marijuana, forgotten the baby was in the bathtub, and that baby drowned. For many years, I was against and I still continue to be against the use of any substance which causes an inebriation to the point that you can no longer be responsible. But that irresponsibility as an individual, whether we like it or not, people of the state of California have spoken and it is legal. We can't build a wall around Citrus Heights and hope that cannabis doesn't come into our community. We're lying to ourselves by preventing the legal sale in our community because it's here whether we like it or not. Uh, irresponsible people, such as children using cannabis illegally, are the consequence of the failure of parental supervision. It is not the fault of the cannabis dispensaries. We need to focus on who's responsible for abuse. For example, fires caused by fireworks are the result of irresponsible individuals, not by responsible individuals. That's why we allow fireworks in our community. We allow alcohol to be sold in our community despite the fact that we have people being killed by drunk drivers. The fact is irresponsible people cause the problem. Last but not least, <clears throat> the city has to wake up to the fact that we're in the 21st century. Things have changed. I can remember the movie about, my God, if you use cannabis or any other drugs, you're going to hell in a handbasket and all the kids that were in that black and white movie in our high school courses. Young people today do not view cannabis as that um, dangerous, and what we need to do is face the fact that the times have changed. Our community has to move forward into the 21st century, kicking and screaming perhaps, but we do need to allow legal sales in the community. I would like to make one last point which has absolutely nothing to do with the argument, and as I would like to 
comment that the, the clerk of our community corrected a very stupid mistake on my part, and I very much appreciate the fact that she undertook it uh, to protect me and my wife. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you very much, David. And also, I'm going to call the next speaker, and then I'm going to let the next after that uh, speaker know so that they can be prepared and, and maybe get up a little quicker. The next one is Carol Alexander, and uh, next after that will be Al Fox. Council members, um, I uh, first of all, I don't think you're reaching all of the people because with these flash things and with your computers that we don't understand and would like to throw out the window uh, where you just press on something and it's supposed to take you to think, that's the reason I'm here tonight. I haven't been out in three years. Uh, at night, um, but I feel I have a right to speak because you gray-haired people, I've been here longer than you guys have. I've been here, my husband's lived on the same property for 87 years, oh. and uh, so anyway, but uh, I would like to just address a couple of things. Um, you're explaining it quite well, and I didn't know how I was feeling about yes or no but uh, I haven't had a chance to even say, uh, yeah, I'd like to get some of this material that you guys are talking about, but I'm not getting it, so I'm not included, and there's a lot of people my age that can't get out of the house that would like to send in these surveys, but they don't even know that you're using them if it's not sent to the registered voters. Uh, and then I do have a couple of... Uh, things that I would like, uh, but you've answered a lot of my, my questions. But I want to know, I don't have this gray hair because I'm stupid and didn't learn something getting here, is that uh, it's a lot easier to get into something than it is to get out of something. And my que I know you can't answer these, but I just want you to think about this because you probably won't see me again. Um, to make hard provisions that if we get into this, that it's in the contract to get out of it. Because if you get into it and you see that, that okay, this isn't, this isn't going well, uh, our arrests and everything are going sky high, then you have to do some extra stuff to get out of it. Make sure that you do this before uh, you sign up, that uh, there's a clause in that to, uh, to get out of it. And uh, like I said, I had these all, but uh, I guess that's just it. Uh, I know that Portland uh, had a lot of drug problems and everything, and they were conservative and they went liberal, and as of two weeks ago, their governor made a law that prohibits all drugs and uh, making it uh, an offense, and they tell how they do it, and I won't waste your time on that. But I do think that you're not getting around uh, us people that don't like computers and uh, can't attend uh, the uh, workshops. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up is Al Fox, followed by John Kane. Good evening, Council Members, Al Fox. There are many arguments both for and against the proposal to allow cannabis dispensaries in Citrus Heights. They're numerous, they're weighty, and in some cases quite humorous. I took the time to read through what you were given in your package and some of the comments that were made there. Um, first, I would point out that the well-organized and orchestrated presentations by the proponents, who understandably are the very owners and employees of the dispensaries who would profit by the change in established Citrus Heights public policy. But in reality, that is all they represent. You are here to represent the people of Citrus Heights. They do not represent the residents, families, businesses, 
One can certainly be moved by the individual success stories of personal rise from poverty, rehabilitation from addiction, despondency, or just being able to relax, but that is not the crux of this issue for the community. According to published law enforcement reports, the sale of illegally grown and processed marijuana in California exponentially outweighs the legal sales. Adding more dispensary locations will not change that fact. The medicinal CBD products derived from marijuana used by many people is available without the dispensaries. We don't need those. Dispensaries only serve to add the medically proven addictive THC component products. The statements, the one supporter, that the dispensaries create no greater risk than other businesses selling liquor products is not a reliable indicator. However, the public record of community sentiment on such as issue is such clear. A previous council in this very chamber pointed to the voices of the community to prevent the addition of an additional licensed seller of alcohol by voting not to change city policy or to grant favor to a large retail liquor outlet so that they could add more liquor store license, or sales to the city of Citrus Heights coffers in the form of taxes collected. There was no overriding need or desire evident in the request and it was contrary to public interest. That is the same we have here. I see nothing presented so far that's been an overriding need to change public policy from what it has been. Vice Mayor Karpinski Costa has, outside this chamber, publicly claimed dispensaries are being approved to provide tax funding for road improvements. Yet evident in the public data only provides that these tax revenues will not be sufficient to contribute to that funding need. It is, the, if the, is the approval already a fait accompli and decided by this council? And is this public comment time just a formality? If that is your official position, the reasoning then presented, the evidence of support to the community is lacking. In closing, I would only ask that you believe our city coffers, if you believe our city coffers are so depleted of resources that we must rely on the minuscule taxes from dispensaries to sustain our infrastructure funding, then instruct staff to prepare a ballot measure and allow citizens to vote their choice relative to allowing this change in the community policy. And I see you have one here about the tax issue also. The only real test of this issue for the city of Citrus Heights is going to be the voter. And that's the one that you should be using. Thank you. Next up is John Kane, followed by Bill Van Duker. Honorable Mayor and esteemed council members, thank you for your service to our community. Um, you know, there were a lot of things. I was there Wednesday night. A lot of things were said um, that upon looking back, I don't know how important they are to the decision that you have to make on this issue. I am very sympathetic to people that are helped by medicinal marijuana use. Um, who wouldn't be? You know, a doctor says drink a glass of wine before dinner or after dinner to help you sleep. I would be very sympathetic to that. But I don't know whether any of the things that were said relative to the benefits or the danger, the crime danger, really has a bearing on whether our city needs them or wants them. I'm a former marijuana addict. It was the gateway drug that led me into alcoholism. I don't know that that has any relevance. I was an addict for six years. I've counseled for over five years. I volunteered in a detox center dealing with drug overdoses and alcohol overdoses and DTs and withdrawals. But that really has nothing to do with whether, in my opinion anyway, whether our city needs this or wants this, okay? Does, do the residents of Citrus Heights want cannabis dispensaries? No one on my street, when we walk the dog and talk to our neighbors, we've lived in the same house for 17 years, wants these in our city. One, one man that works for the Board of Equalization said, well, I have to look into it a little bit. He's a young guy, super nice guy, two, three kids. He said, I'm gonna have to look into it because you know the tax issues, it's a cash business. You know, uh, I'm not sure, I, I'm gonna look into it. You know, they might be good, they might be bad. So I said, okay. Is it something the community needs? The answer is no. I called one of the dispensaries. I can order 11 product lines online. 
the lady said, uh, yeah, you can, are you 21? Or, yes, I am. Okay, well, set up a profile. It's like going to Domino's. Set up a profile, put in your credit card, and you can pick anything you want. We deliver it right to your house. Does Amazon need a store in Citrus Heights? Answer, no. <laughs> they deliver. Every dis I call two dispensaries. They will deliver any product here. Do we need a storefront? Answer, no. Our city has voted it down before. I had a lot of fun doing a deep dive on why. Ready for this? I'm sure you know this. Roseville, Rockland, Folsom, Rancho Cordova, and cities all over the country, similar to ours, do not have dispensaries. And whether it's crime or no crime or this or that, trying to get through that was, was tough. In 2022, the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors voted down a measure to put it into the unincorporated areas of Sacramento County. Why? Why do these cities not have them? Why did they say no? Why did the county say no? Do we need an Italian restaurant in Citrus Heights? Yes. <laughs> okay, do we need cannabis dispensaries? No. Thank you. Next up, Bill Van Duker followed by Isaac Altamirano. Good evening, Mayor Daniels, Vice Mayor Karpinski Koska, and, and council members. <clears throat> With your permission, I'd like to request Ms. Ms. Huber put up the slide that has the dots on it. <clears throat> After staying away from council meetings for years at a time, I now come before you the second time in two months, uh, go figure. The community meeting last Wednesday was instructive on several levels. It appeared that there were as many people who were employed in the marijuana industry as there were Citrus Heights residents. And that uh, display right there represents the fact that all of the people who were from outside of Citrus Heights who represented a cannabis business downtown and one in the foothills all had blue dots. And if we ex exclude those blue dots, I think it would, I guess they're blue, I'm colorblind, but whatever color they are, if we exclude them, then the picture would be quite different. The folks from the cannabis industry seem to imply that the heavens would open and the angels would sing if only we opened a couple of dispensaries. In talking with, <coughs> excuse me, several of them after the meeting, I learned that it would take upwards of a million dollars in capital to start a new dispensary. They also confirmed that most of the shops in the city of Sacramento were controlled by one corporation. The usual sources for a million dollars is either big tobacco or money from China. Traditional sources like banks are, of course, not available because of federal law. Tuesday's Sacramento Bee article about favoritism in the city of Sacramento and all sorts of winks and nods in the awarding of licenses was disturbing. I don't know if you've seen that. And minority set-asides for licenses in California have largely gone unclaimed. Let's talk about the two proposed locations near the freeway. Both of these locations have been earmarked for possible hotel locations. <coughs> We have on staff here at the city an expert on the hospitality industry. And I hope you seek her input on the ability of the city to attract a Hilton, a Hyatt, or a Marriott to a location that already has a pot dispensary in the vicinity. The city of Roseville probably hopes that Citrus Heights approves the dispensaries so that Roseville won't have to deal with the issue. Roseville can sit back and collect the transit and occupancy taxes from the 27 hotels that they have that serve our families and friends in Citrus Heights because we don't have a hotel. And regarding traffic, as I pointed out on Wednesday, the Citrus Heights dispensaries would be the only ones between Sacramento and Colfax. I would guess that the service area for these dispensaries would encompass a popul population base in excess of half a million people. The clients from Orangevale wouldn't use the freeways, nor would the clients from Fair Oaks, Carmichael, Foothill Farms, or Antelope. 
So what would the impact be on already overcrowded streets? The Antelope Interchange is especially problematic. We have at that interchange one of the premier businesses and employers in Citrus Heights in Stones Casino. I would hate for their business to be negatively impacted because of significant traffic increases. Uh, Mr. Mayor, you've been quoted as saying it's not about the money. If it's not about the money, then would we be better off with dispensaries or without them? As has already been commented tonight, five of the seven incorporated cities in Sacramento, Sacramento County have said that they would be better without them. Ialton had two dispensaries and one of them just recently closed. Five of the six cities in Placer County have said no, Col Colfax being the exception. It is my belief that Citrus Heights would be better without them. I hope you agree. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Isaac Altamirano, followed by Richard Bartlett. Hi, how is everybody doing? Nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Isaac Altamirano. I am, uh, actually I live down the street. Um, my wife and I are cannabis operators and we actually live in Citrus Heights. We own a home in Citrus Heights and we've been here for almost seven years. Uh, we have four teenagers. Our oldest daughter works in the San Juan School District. Our oldest son works at the Dairy Coon where you probably get your blizzards right here on Brookhaven, right across our house. He walks home from work. Unlike uh, some of the comments being said, we do live here. And our cannabis business is over an hour and a half away because our business in Sacramento had to finish and, and we had to sever ties with the city because of preferitism and the way they did their permitting in terms of who's their best friend. So we went to Rio Vista, we're in the Solano County now, and we drive an hour and a half for a micro business, which is three single uses. We have distribution, manufacturing, non-volatile, and delivery. I've run a delivery service in the greater Sacramento area for six years. I have a lot of data, a lot of customers here that are my neighbors. I suppose as some of the comments, the neighbors on my street would like to see me more often. I suppose I see me go drive and not come back to very late every day. Um, my plea here is not whether the motion needs to be passed or not passed. My plea here is that if you do pass something, that you remember the small mom and pops and not just the big companies that are out there. If it's all about the big companies, I'm gonna join the team that is opposed to it and continue to drive an hour and a half away from this place and come back home and keep doing my thing. I would love to come to work and stay here. I would love to have a micro business, something that is not necessarily a storefront dispensary. My operation is so discreet, only the police department in Rio Vista knows where I'm at and the Department of Cannabis Control and of course the city. No customers know where I'm at. Something similar in an industrial or a warehouse area in the city of Citrus Heights is an alternative to storefronts or an overfloating of storefronts which can find a compromise between some of the comments here. Additionally to that, if there is to be some type of permitting or some type of motion to move forward, it's important that you hear more about some of the members in the community. Not all of us are opposed. A lot of us are, but we work. We work a lot of hours. And I had to get out of work early to be here on time today to make sure you I'm heard. There's a lot of meetings that I missed that I've been paying attention from the distance and I haven't been able to meet every single one of you in person and let you know who I am. There's four votes that come from my household every single election towards the local government. And I'm glad that you're inviting us to be part of this because this is important. It is not just li our lifestyle, it is our livelihood. It's how we feed our children. And additionally to that, I am a refugee of the war on drugs. I'm originally from Texas. I came here and I moved here to pursue a career with cannabis because it's a passion of mine and it's a passion of my wife and it's a passion of the people that we associate with. We're not criminals. We raise our children with high standards and good morals. We worship in a good way and we try to do our best to our community and to try to stay afloat with everything and be mindful of everyone. Um, it is important that you listen to others, not just the big companies. Um, my heart is racing right now. A lot of the things that I wrote down are now a blur, and I'm not necessarily saying exactly what I was planning on saying, but the gist of what I wanted to say is, 
Yes, there are Citrus Heights residents and citizens that pay mortgage and taxes here that actually are in the cannabis industry and that would love to have their work here instead of driving so freaking far away to try to get their bread and their table. And if the opportunity is only given to one that doesn't even live here, that employs people who don't even live here, then you're neglecting some of us that are actually here every day and that actually do everything we have to do to continue to be members of the society. <coughs> so just to conclude, The last thing I wanted to say is that um, I have a lot of data. I have a lot of knowledge. I've been in the legal industry for over six years. Utilize me. I'm, I'm, I'm available. I can reach out to whoever needs to be informed. I have data and I have knowledge. I, I have an event organizer license, a micro business license, and I've had, I've had a lot of connections and I know state officials and I know the regulation quite well at the state level because if I don't, then I can end up breaking the law without wanting to. So it's important for me to know all these things. So I urge you to involve me or somebody that lives here and hear us out. And that's all I have to say. I appreciate this even being a topic. Thank you for, the, for your time and you. for your service. Thank you, sir, very much. Next up, Richard Bartlett, followed by Bill Shirley. Good evening. I've. Uh... I've been a, resi a resident of the Heights for over 40 years, and uh, it's been a great place to live and a great place to raise a family, you know. Um, I, I would like to re respond to something that was said <laughs> earlier by, by one, one gentleman about uh, uh, cannabis use being legal. Um, I, I find it a contradiction that Federally, it's illegal, and we can violate that law, but we can choose which laws we're going to conform to and which we're not. But the reality is this. Simply because something has been declared legal does not mean that it's moral, that it's <coughs> right, that it's correct, or that it's even in the best interest of the community. And I think we can all give multiple examples of that. Um, I, I, I know of individuals who routinely use cannabis, and I'm in my 70s. I don't. But they've indicated to me there's no difficulty in ordering and having it delivered, which was said previously. It's not an obstacle if somebody uh, uh, truly, uh, uh, truly wants it. I've attended a couple of these meetings. And I'll tell you, I was a little disappointed because questions were asked about what type of effect does cannabis dispensaries have on potential crime and increased use of the drug. And there was no answer. And, and, I, and I, excuse me, I don't know how we could even move forward with consideration without being able to answer those questions or maybe speaking to cities that, that surround us who have rejected and not approved it and ask them why. Uh, somebody indicated, and I don't know whether uh, the tax incentive is, is a primary consideration for this or not. I hope it's not. It certainly shouldn't be. And what, what should be the, the, the overriding consideration is, is, is it in the best interest of the public. Thank you. Thank you, sir, very much. Next up, Bill Shirley, followed by Ray Reilly. So I had an opportunity to attend the workshop, and one thing I'd ask you to do, Time Magazine, have you seen it? What's the title? Cannabis. I hope you guys will take the time and look at it, because I think they're giving you a very fair evaluation of the cities that have already uh, in, you know, incorporated uh, dispensaries. They talk about the states, thinking they're going to bring all this money in. And so it's very interesting, and I think it would be a, a quite an eye-opener for you. So as the board was brought up when we saw the dots, first of all, you notice there's very few in between. So people are either going to be in favor or they're going to be imposed, opposed. So if it comes down to a vote uh, where we vote as the city, it's going to be a very, very divisive campaign. 
And um, I think one side will have a definite advantage because they'll have more money available to them to be able to have that vote go in their favor. The majority of those who spoke at the meeting uh, that stood up, and I kept quiet last time because I wanted to listen, were people that would take, you know, it would be to their advantage to have dispensaries in our city. Either they were distributing, they owned, or they sold. Now, it's already been brought up that, uh, you know, I didn't want to drive down to Sacramento. Well, we have two, dispensary, or two dispensaries on wheels. It's, one is known as Citrus Heights Dispensary on Wheels. Simple call, they'll bring it. And Marijuana Delivery Citrus Heights. So those are available. So I don't want to hear that you have to run down to, uh, down to uh, Sacramento to, to buy your product. You may want to go down there sometimes to see what's new and what's available, but it, it doesn't have to be. I talked to my neighbor, he smokes all the time, and he said, I will never waste my time going downtown when I can pick up my phone, press the button, and here it comes. Now the thing is, and I think we've really been kind of ignoring, and it wasn't really brought up, is if you make a product more available, guess what? It'll be more readily available to be used. And one of the things that Time Magazine would brought out was as more and more adults of the home use it, and we've heard about, well, that the kids need to be educated, but still they say the facts are that more and more of the kids will be using uh, uh, marijuana or different uh, cannabis products. So, I mean, to me, what is the city looking for um, as far as having uh, dispensaries here? What is the real motive? And I hope it is not money, because once again, Time Magazine came out and said, if you're looking for money, you're really barking up the wrong tree. So once again, take a look. Um, I do not blame the dispensaries for wanting to come into the city. One, I mean, they would have prime, prime locations. I-80, these major thoroughfares, they could put them there, you can get off the freeway, you go purchase, and off you go. And like those said, the surrounding areas would love to see us do it so they don't have to deal with it. And it was brought up, as Dick brought up, we're already known as the Heights guys. What do we want our image as a city? We're trying to uplift our image, and I'm not you know, saying these dispensaries you know, they're going to bring um, crime in. It's going to be a bad haven for them to be here. But what is the end product of what they sell coming into our community? I'd like to ask the business owners, would you want that business next to yours? I heard some say, hey, I have no problem. But it's like a lot of things. Until it's your next door neighbor, um, would you approve it? Um, I would say the city needs to reach out to the areas that they're proposing this and talk to the business owners. They should have a definite say in what is it to be. I would say, too, that um, we also need to put it to a vote. Uh, no offense, Council, but I think this is not something you guys need to decide on. If it's something you want to push forward, then it needs to be the people of the city that vote for it. Cannabis today, <coughs> 50 years ago, it was 2 to 3% um, THC level. You know what it is now? 20 so it's become stronger, it's, you know, it has stronger effects. And I'll just leave with this. Once again, I say it's up to the city, and let us decide if this, this is what you guys conclude. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Next up, Ray Reilly, followed by Jimmy Bobeck. Well, good evening, Mayor Daniels, Vice Mayor Karpinski-Costa, <coughs> and board or council sorry water board stuff I get confused easily <laughs> my name's Ray really I'm back in Citrus Heights I grew up in Citrus Heights moved to Orangevale and now my wife Diane and I are back thank you for the opportunity to address undress bringing marijuana dispensaries to the city of Citrus Heights I believe that the businesses we invite into the city reflect the character of the city. It is my opinion that such, such dispensaries will degrade the character of our community. We have not invited juice bars back into the city, and I think we have limits on the number of massage parlors. 
If such businesses are not promoted by the Economic Development Department of Citrus Heights, why would we want to include marijuana dispensaries on the list of businesses in our city? As a longtime member of the City of Cit uh, the Citrus Heights Chamber of Commerce, I am certain that I would not support such entities as members of our chamber. I have a long list of concerns. Most of them have been touched on already. I'm not going to bore you with those, at least not now. I'd like to see consideration of this issue dropped, option two, and that marijuana dispensaries not become a part of the business community of our city. If the council would like to pursue dispensaries, I would ask that you put it to a vote of the people. I'm not sure of the process, but I believe an issue as important and complex as this deserves serious attention that you would find in a campaign and in a ballot initiative. So please look to a more robust discussion that involves the whole community, people who can get to meetings, people who cannot get to meetings, people who are online, people who are not online, because complex issues require robust and detailed discussion. And I don't know that we can get that as effectively here on an issue that's this consequential. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next up. Next up, Jimmy Bobak, followed by Carla Lowe, I believe it is. Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council, uh, I'll try to make it really quick. I appreciate everyone hearing me out today. Um, I wanted to um, just state that I agree with, I believe the first speaker was David Wren. I think he hit a lot of topics that I was going to say today, so I'll be quick and say I, I'm fully in alignment with him. Uh, I appreciate his comment about saying times are changing. Uh, one thing I do want to clarify, there's a lot of discussions around um, delivery services. So um, when everyone in here, whether you're for or against it, I don't think I'm changing anyone's mind in the next 40 seconds here, but I want to clarify what delivery means. So when you do order from a store, typically that store is sending out um, one order for that delivery. It's kind of a service you get, sort of like if you're ordering from a pizza parlor forever or, or whatever, excuse me. Um, a delivery only company, which is primarily what, and I pulled a quick picture, I don't know if anyone can see it, I know you guys had presented it in um, last week's meeting when you go on Weed Maps, which is sort of like the Yelp of cannabis companies, it, it shows a bunch of little dots. And what that is, is those are delivery companies that are set up in cities outside of Citrus Heights. And what they do is they um, take a car and they have a trunk full of cannabis. So when you're ordering, they're sitting in parking lots. So right now when I look at this right here, they're open to usually 10 or 11 at night, um, so they're highly unregulated. It, they're, they're here, they're, they're sitting in parking lots all over the, the city currently, um, so they can get it to you in like 15 or 20 minutes. So they have an online menu, they have cars, again, in Citrus Heights and Roseville, they're dropping those pins. So you can sort of look at it, it might be a, an aggressive comment, but they're already 30 to 40 dispensaries sitting here currently in Citrus Heights, just they're sitting in the back of a car. There are some limitations to um, how much they can have at one point. I'm not super understanding of, of what that limitation is. I believe it's like three to 5,000. Um, my personal opinion um, is that those are highly unregulated, a lot harder to um, um, uh, keep your eyes on, and, and they pose a, uh, a more, um, I would say, they're more prone to crime. So I lied, I went close to two minutes, so apologize, take care, <laughs> thank you. Next up, Carla Lowe, followed by Al Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the uh, council. My name is Carla Lowe. I live on the other side of Madison, so I'm in Carmichael, but I'm very close to you. And I would have brought you material, but I know you all have received a packet of material uh, opposing bringing in uh, cannabis dispensaries, which are called pot shops. And they are purveyors and promoters of addiction, nothing less. Just a little bit of perspective. It was in 1977, that's 47 years ago, that I took a turn as PTA president at Del Campo, and I agreed if we surveyed the parents then, I'm not sure any of these people 
were parents then. They're all grandparents and great-grandparents now. But we surveyed the parents to determine what we should do as a PTA for one year in 1977. We listed 20 different uh, categories. Alcohol and tobacco was included. At the last minute, we added drugs because there had been a skirmish behind the school, and I'd been called and said we need to do something about the access to the back of the school. Call Bill Bryant, our supervisor. We closed that off. But we put out the survey, added drugs, 25% return on the survey. Number one was drugs, not alcohol, not tobacco. My friend and then superintendent, John Strimple, superintendent of San Juan, said, my gosh, we've got to do this all across the district, which he did under his name. 1977, number one concern of parents across the district was marijuana. We did follow-up surveys, how do you, how did the kids get the met marijuana, so forth and so on, always from older kids. And that was even before pot shops, because now the way they get material, they get their smokes, they get whatever they want, is from older kids who go to the pot shops. I've watched with my own, with my own eyes. So in 1979, you might be interested to know that a man named Keith Stroop, who was incoming president of the National Organization to Reform Marijuana Laws, said, and I happened to be there in Atlanta, if in our quest to see marijuana legalized, we are serious, then first we must get it accepted as a medicine. That will be the red herring we need. That will be the ruse. That will be the dupe to talk to the public because they're very sympathetic. And as you know, funded by millions of dollars from George Soros and others, California voters voted for, quote, medical marijuana. It's never been approved as a medicine. One of the gentlemen did remind you that marijuana under federal law is illegal. It has never been approved as a medicine. All the pot shops are operating illegally under federal law. I think, as somebody else mentioned, the money. Uh, this is billion-dollar business by consortiums funded, um, founded around the world. One of the biggest uh, pot shops that we've been following is Cureleaf. You can go online, watch what's happened to their, um, to their income in the last couple of years. It's fallen. The illegal market is wiping out the legal pot shops, period. I think it's interesting, just one other thing on just a background. It's important to know, someone mentioned that today's marijuana is stronger. That's absolutely right. When I first started all those 47 years ago, it was about 2 to 4% THC. Today's street pot is 20, 25, 30% THC. And all of the solids, the vaping, the edibles, those are up to 90, 98% THC, folks. And THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, is unique in that it's fat-soluble. Fat-soluble means once it gets into the body, it's not washed out, flushed out, as are almost every other drug. It stays in the body a long time, primarily in the brains and the sex organs. A half-life of THC is about one week. That's a long time. Our kids are smoking once a week. At the end of a month, they are literally, their body is saturated. We're talking about a serious matter, and I'm really encouraging you to understand that the more pot shops, there's data. I've given you some. I can give you more. Wherever there are pot shops, more kids are going to use. Our children have a right to grow up safe and healthy and drug-free. Oh, that's a light. That must mean I need to stop. Just one more thing to remind you. Um, kids use, somebody mentioned that. Uh, kids use in California five years ago was 35% higher than the national average. I think that's very important to know. 20% of all people over 12 use marijuana. Consider the pot high drivers on our streets. Hit and run. I'm asking you please to consider, not to consider, but I see option two. I uh, ask you to stop. It was here that I came to you folks 46 years ago you, when the county board, somebody mentioned it, when the county board voted to not have any pot shops. I, I need was you to there. wrap up your remarks, okay? 
Pardon me? You gotta wrap up your remarks. Right. Time has expired. We went to every city in the, in the county, and the first city we came to was your city uh, all those years ago, and then all six of the seven all followed suit and said, no pot shops. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Albert Sanchez, followed by Benny Gardner. <laughs> Hi, my name is Alfred Sanchez. I remember when I first moved here, I, I, I came here without something in writing. I'm doing this off the cuff. But when I first moved here, I was so proud that uh, I had moved here and I was closing escrow and I couldn't vote it in the city, but I was really involved with the city and the county. And uh, I like what we have here. We have the ability to regulate ourselves. It's, it, it's, it's kind of a neat thing. It's like, it's like we said, hey, we're gonna be a city, we're gonna do this. Um, most of you know me, some of you have even been to my house. Um, I'm going for option three because if this doesn't make us a lot of money, it's unnecessary. That's, that's you know, that's the big thing. If it doesn't make us a lot of money, it's unnecessary. Like, like they're saying, it's already here. I went to the uh, workshop on the third. I met some really beautiful people. I mean, I looked in their eyes. I believe, I believe they got good hearts. You know, I, I believe that. I really do. Honestly, in my heart, I believe they have good hearts. So um, I worry about fentanyl. So I worry about the quality. So if you're doing it for accessibility, don't bother. If you're doing it so that it's safer, okay. Uh, I, I, um, my vote is for option three because if we're doing it for the money, then I hope it's a lot of money. Otherwise, um, it's just, uh, it, it just seems like, I, you know, I, I, I want to say things, but I don't want to hurt people's feelings, especially you guys. I believe you guys have good hearts, but I think it cheapens the city if we allow it. I'm sorry to put it that way. I just don't have any other way to put it. I love each and every one of you. Like I said, I know each and every one of you, but let's do this for the right reasons. Let's not do it for the wrong reasons. Ta-da. <laughs> Thank you, Alfred. Next up, Benny Gardner. Honorable Mayor and Honorable Vice Mayor and esteemed council members, thank you for your service to the community. Thanks for listening to us all. And you know, thanks for considering drafting a cannabis ordinance. Um, I think it should be clear to you by looking at, you know, Prop 215, uh, Prop 64, where the voters stand on cannabis. Uh, most voters, you know, approve cannabis and cannabis business. Um, you know, I don't think there's anything preventing hotels or Italian restaurants from coming to our city. Um, nothing that I know of. There, there's definitely things preventing cannabis businesses from coming to your city, and that's drafting a reasonable ordinance. Um, I think there's things for you to consider when drafting your ordinance. Um, if you limit con competition, um, you know, applying some kind of moratorium, offering limited licenses, um, I don't think you're affording um, competition, you know, and, you know, access. Um, I think also Prop 64 has sufficient, you know, regulations. I don't think we should be considering additional buffer zones to the buffer zones that exist. Um, I think commercial, commercial property owners um, deserve to be able to rent to who they want to, sell to who they want to. I think other businesses, you know, as approved by California voters, deserve the right to, to operate in Citrus Heights. Um, I think if we're gonna consider buffer zones and, you know, we're gonna consider cannabis as a substance, we should also be considering buffer zones on, you know, tobacco and alcohol stores. 
Um, if we're concerned about cash businesses, you know, we should be concerned about banking, uh, grocery stores. Um, you know, we do have all these out-of-town deliveries happening in Citrus Heights. I don't think that affords us the tax benefit of having those businesses here in town. Um, so please, I urge you to consider other cannabis businesses besides retail. Um, consider non-storefront retail, which is, which is, you know, definitely could add some competition to the retailers. Um, you should also consider cultivation, manufacturing. Um, these are these are businesses. You know, I'm a farmer. I farm a product. Um, I use my resources to to create a business to to, to farm something that I can turn into profits and I can provide jobs for people. Um, my businesses not only employ, you know, the one here in Sacramento, 20 employees, but we employ plumbers, we employ HVAC, we employ payroll, we employ the state. Um, so I think the impact of a cannabis business is greater just than, you know, your, 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 your local tax. Um, you're going to be providing jobs for people who then provide jobs for other people. Um, so please just don't, don't discriminate against cannabis and, uh, you know, cannabis people um, like myself who's a, a homeowner and a resident here. So thanks. Thank you very much. That's the end of the speakers. Um, we got it in under an hour, so I'm happy about that. Um, um, anything from staff? I do have the ones to read as well. I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Um, so I'll read the written comment that was submitted to be read tonight. Um, the first one is from Mager Roberta McGlashan, and she states, I represented the city of Citrus Heights for 20 years. Approving retail marijuana stores is the wrong direction for Citrus Heights. The ballot measure that legalized recreational marijuana use maintained the right for cities to decide whether to allow retail sales. Only Sacramento and Isleton allow retail sales in Sacramento County. Citrus Heights residents can easily obtain the product in Sacramento or via delivery service. I understand the attraction of additional revenue to fund city services and, in, and infrastructure, but is it worth it? Is this the new image the city wants to promote as you work to reimagine the future of Sunrise Mall and Sunrise Marketplace? Proposed taxation and establishment of marijuana businesses will, re will require establishment of a new program and staffing to administer. It will require code enforcement, auditing, compliance, monitoring, and addressing social equity. Have you addressed the numbers and locations of these businesses? Will they be permitted uses in which zones or require a use permit? Will there be setbacks from sensitive uses? Will they be allowed near prime locations such as Sunrise Marketplace, City Hall, the Community Center? Marijuana retailers will try to sell you on an attractive veneer that normalizes recreational drug use. Don't be fooled. Putting Citrus Heights on the map as a destination for marijuana sales will not increase public safety or burnish the city's image. And the marginal increase in revenues will be limited by the cost of administration. This de decision could forever change the character of the city we worked so hard to form. The next public comment is Jeannie Bruins, and she states, Mayor and, Mayor and Council Members, I'm out of town and unable to attend the meeting, so I'm submitting my comments in writing to be read into the record. The Vice Mayor Karpinski Costa told me that the Council was bringing marijuana retail stores to Citrus Heights to fund road improvements. Yet at the March 14th council meeting, Mayor Daniels stated that allowing marijuana stores in Citrus Heights is not about the money, that the city has plenty of money in the budget and reserve. If it isn't about the money, then what is it about? Any revenue raised will do nothing other than fund additional police to handle the increased crime and homelessness attracted to this island of marijuana sales because surrounding jurisdictions have the sense to, de to deny the presence of marijuana retail stores. Each council member received a publication entitled The Risks of Marijuana Usage. I hope you read it. Despite the rhetoric of the marijuana purveyors, it is scientifically and medically proven that the THC level in marijuana today reaches up to 30% as compared to the marijuana of the 60s and 70s at about 3%. It is genetically modified to be highly addictive. If you change the ordinance to allow marijuana retail sales in Citrus Heights, do it with the full knowledge of the harm that you are doing to our city. Sacramento is a haven for marijuana stores. Folsom and Roseville prohibit them. Look at these cities. Which ones do you want to emulate? 
The next comment, um, they just wrote their last name, which is Sloan, and they state, I am unable to attend the meeting tonight, but want to voice my dismay that our city leaders are even considering putting marijuana stores in our community. I know most of you and that you have children and or grandchildren. Is this the future you want for them? Is it hard for, it is hard for me to believe that drugs are the answer to the world's problems. As a mother and grandmother, I am personally aware of the dangers of marijuana. It can be the stepping stone to a life of misery. Since our mayor stated we do not need the funding, then why would you even consider this option? I see no good outcome for this action. I ask you to reconsider your recommendation to purposely trying to destroy the lives of children and families with your decision to support these stores. I don't need to state the obvious risks to the citizens of our once great community. Let your conscience be your guide. Is this the legacy you want to leave behind? The next comment is from Donna Crawford, and they state, I want to start by saying I am totally against cannabis dispensaries in our city. I have a brother who marijuana has totally altered his life. He started at age 12 smoking marijuana and now has schizophrenia so bad that he hears voices and is in and out of jail because of his use. As I said in an email I sent to the city manager in the city council last week, a report recently shown on World News Tonight, a study found the potency of THC is 10 times higher in today's marijuana than in the 60s, 70s, or 80s, and daily use resulted in five times the amount of psychosis which has proven to go on to schizophrenia or bipolar. These statistics don't lie. I would hope those making this decision will consider banning these dispensaries in Citrus Heights. The next comment is from Amanda Carrillo. Uh, she states, I am in favor of retail cannabis, and she did submit um, a letter in there were other uh, letters that were submitted um, after the posting of the agenda packet, and those have been those copies have been provided to council tonight. The next comment is from Mark Carrillo. Um, the Weed for Warriors project is pro retail storefront cannabis access for Citrus Heights, and they also submitted a letter which has been provided to the city council. The last written public comment is from Irene Ronson. At Ron is sick. I'm sorry if I mispronounce that. Mayor Daniels and council members, I am sorry to miss the opportunity to speak in person. Please include my comments for the record. I urge city council to review and maintain the original concerns and intentions of the city when the existing ordinance was put in place. The concerns still exist and hopefully the intentions retain their importance. Much time and money has been spent by the marijuana industry to modify and increase the THC levels, making the marijuana sold today more addictive and damaging. Please consider this when allowing edibles and weed to become even more available in our city. The proposal to allow marijuana sales within 2,500 feet of Interstate 80 would offer freeway visibility and draw non-residents into the already congested areas at Antelope and I-80 and Auburn and I-80. Is it the intention of the city to make these areas a destination for financial gain? Is this the forward-facing image we wish to promote? Are other cities like Roseville and Rockland working to promote this image among commuters, travelers, and residents? The proposed areas at Antelope and at Auburn are already targeted by the city for beautification and blight abatement. These areas already have concerns of traffic congestion, campers, panhandlers, blight from destroyed fences and property and collected trash. The city and CHPD already expend resources to reduce these existing concerns. Is it anticipated that these concerns will, re will reduce or increase if marijuana sales are allowed? Please consider all sides and consequences. Thank you. And that concludes the written comment. All right. Thank you very much. We still got it in under an hour. <laughs> all right. Um, so um, uh, before we go with any questions or comments, anything else from staff at this point? Uh, questions, comments? Jane, go ahead. As I mentioned in my council comments earlier, um, I attended strategic planning. And strategic planning is really an inspirational time for staff to share what they want to do for the next three years and for the council to give their feedback on that hope and vision. When I, when I look at the backdrop of our strategic plan, all the wonderful 
plans that we have for our city to grow our economy, to invite businesses to our community, and to combat homelessness, to combat any crime in our city, to raise our education, to raise our neighborhood awareness, cannabis does not have a place in that vision for me. Many of you know that I have a story and experience with cannabis, um, and, and you can look it up. It's been widely reported. And it's true. Do we need the money? No. We can find and attract other businesses to support our community in ways that are less controversial, more meaningful, and well accepted. Another point to make is along with strategic planning, we have a very lean, smart team of employees that are servicing grant dollars that do they really need the distraction of doing a, a concentrated effort in a subject that is so highly contested in our community? We've received individually and collectively emails every day since this came up for discussion. I believe our staff, which is amazing <coughs> in getting grant dollars, in creative ways to pave our roads, to beautify our city, they need time, more time, to do those things and to bring more money to keep our, our city streets looking good and being safe for all members of our community, both the seniors who have been here, I heard 70 plus years, 80 something years, and then our newest members to our community, our youth. And so with that, I, I would opt for option two. Thank you. Thank you very much. Council Member Middleton. Mm -hmm. um, I need a few more minutes to collect my thoughts. Okay. Council Member Schaefer, anything? Thank you, Mayor. So uh, for me, it is about the money. I did the math. 39 years to, to pave our roads at our current rate. We spend $4 million a year paving our roads. It takes 39 years. That's, that's less than a cycle of a road. Um, yes, it is about the money. Yes, we have a, we're doing great. We're happy with the city manager. He provided us with a $4 million surplus. But as I alluded to earlier, we need to put that $4 million into reserves because tougher times are coming. So the bottom line is we don't want to allocate more out of our general fund than we already are to, to road repairs. So what's the next revenue source? I'm open to ideas for sure. I, I, I will say though, that some of this propaganda that we received, m marijuana and mass murder, I haven't used marijuana in 40 years, but that was the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. It, is, it was just, what do you think, we're idiots? This is not, uh, anyway, bottom line is, my, I, would, I would favor another option. I understand and I hear the community. I do hear the community. I hear the community of, I hear a lot of people saying we, they support this and I hear a lot of people against this. I think we need to slow this down. I don't wanna rush something to the ballot that we need to, because right now we're late. We, we would be really cramming things by November. So what I'd like to do is, let's take a year. Let's look at this, let's look at this carefully. Let's not rush to a conclusion here and let's, let's really develop a plan on let's, do we really wanna do this? Because quite honestly, I am not to a point where I can say, yes, I support this. Because yes, I have some concerns. I have some, some concerns of some of the points that you guys made is, is this the image we wanna to project to us? And I went down and I, I toured the sanctuary. It's a beautiful building, it's, a, it's well planned, it's well laid out, it is not a, um, a crappy building. It, 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 they employ 85 people there. Um, they they do a pretty serious volume of business. I think that I met the owner here, who happens to be here, and is a very upstanding guy. And I, I this I've met a lot of people in the cannabis industry. I, again, I'm not a user. I I appreciate that um, uh, Benny Gardner opened his doors 
because there's a risk to, to opening the doors. When we went through, we had to gown up. All of our shoes had to be uh, sterilized. We're not, you know, these, this is an incredibly clean facility um, and high security. So what I, my recommendation to council, and I would like to see somebody support this, is let's go to option four. Let's push this out and really look at this issue. We've jumped into this so quickly that I think that I think, I need more time, and I think the community needs more time. Thank you. Um, yeah. Go ahead, okay. Councilmember Middleton. Um, I think we all can agree that we know that cannabis is here, it's being delivered, and there's also some new information that was presented to me tonight. I, I've heard, I've read all the comments. I do agree with Councilmember Schaefer. We should very much slow this down because when we're talking about that equity piece, I want to make sure that we actually get it right. When I talk about equity, I'm not just talking about persons of colors or those, or those who've been impacted you know, adversely by the industry. I'm talking about our residents who are sitting right here in our own city um, who, who would like an opportunity if we were to move forward with this to be able to participate. What I'm hearing is not that we don't, what I'm hearing is, is the issue of retail and dispensary. I'm not hearing that, okay, if we want to manufacture, cultivate, if we want something that's, that's not forward public facing, so I think that's something that we need to take a deeper look into and that extra time will allow us that. For me, this has always been about local control. We have always been great stewards of our own tax dollars. If we are allowing other cities to take advantage of our, of our families who are living here, their hard earned money, however they choose to spend it, and it's going somewhere else, that is an opportunity that is lost to reinvest those dollars right here in our city. I want to make sure that we're providing that opportunity for our residents to get the full benefit of what it means to live in this city. So slowing it down sounds like it might be the right answer. Vice Mayor Karpinski Costa. Well, that's three because I agree with uh, Council Member Schaefer and Council Member Middleton. We, we started too fast, so option one is out. Uh, um, um, I even think option two is out based on the speed because I don't know that saying no is right at this time because we still have more information. I would tempt to go to option three, except I think it's just a redo of Prop 64. So I am with option four, and I think we should do more. It's, we heard some stuff tonight that I took notes on that I still want to look at. We have gotten... A lot of propaganda. I mean, to say it causes this and that is not a reason not to have it because there's no proof that it does cause what some of these people, mass murders or whatever. But it's, it's the user who, the responsible... I, I was interested in Mr. Warren's comments the most. I mean, how does... Uh, I want to know how a dispensary <coughs> helps reduce the... It, was he call it illegal or what do you call it the stuff okay so I don't know anything about this topic I mean I am ignorant but I did read in my last veterinary journal that came this week that Congress is trying to make it a schedule three instead of a schedule one so if that's true and it, it's uh, is it Chuck Schumer or one of those so the majority is working on it and of course that could mean it takes 10 years but um, if that's true, and little by little, I think that more and more community, and I think some of the bad communities where dispensaries have hurt them is because they went too fast, they were so greedy about the money, they wanted to get the money, they didn't put any thought into their ordinance. Yes, the, the regulations of Prop 64 are there, but I think communities need to go above and beyond as we do have the authority to do that, and we can make it safer than some of the communities who have failed because they did not look at their community, ask the community what their biggest concerns were. And so I think we need to look at land uses first and see, you know, I think that's critical is where would we put them? Because if you're gonna put it in my neighborhood, I would say no. I don't want people driving down my street to, to, to go to the store. So, so where would we put them would be my big thought. So I'd like to start there with land use and take community, I do think we need to do more outreach. As Carol Alexander pointed out, I'm shocked that, that there's a lot in, I know at our SOAR meetings, we have people we have to call on the phone because they can't take uh, email notifications. 
So it, it's, it, it is, we are still a community of a lot of people who do not use social media, who do not use, so I, I'd like to see a lot more outreach. I'd like to talk about first the, the, the zoning, the where would we put them? It doesn't say we have an ordinance, that's not saying we're gonna have them, it just says if we had them, where would we put them? Because that makes a difference to me. And so, um, yeah, on the freeway is good because they're not traipsing through the neighborhood, but there's other things you do with your regulations besides, and I will tell you, it would be nice to have a hotel over there at, at, at the corner of I-80 and Antelope, but they don't want to, I mean, they don't want to come here because we have tattoo parlors, vape stores, thrift stores, low income, housing, everything. So, so we are a low income demographic. There's no way around it. So it's hard for us to attract high-end restaurants. They don't want to come here. It's hard for us to attract hotels. I, we got one coming that, that's going to be on Greenback, so we do have at least one to get started. Uh, we anticipate some more in the Sunrise tomorrow. Uh, that would be as part of the development of the Sunrise uh, Mall. And so you know, we look forward to seeing that come forward. I don't think a dispensary ruins the city's reputation when we have so much thrift stores and drive through fast foods and it, you know who wants to go to Antelope Road? A used car lot. Do you want a used car lot? And is that who we are? Is a used car lot in Citrus Heights? So, you know, we, we have to be careful what we put where. And that's my first concern is what we, where would we put this to make it more acceptable? And then make an ordinance if we pass it to make sure people understand. I think we can do a good job on this, and it is about the money. I think our city manager, how much, 82 million to <coughs> do our roads. Okay, you all think you're getting 300 roads paved in the next three years with our new money? Okay, I'm in District 4, Area 6, you are all in my district, half of Area 10 and some of Area um, 4. Two? Two, I think it's two. And how many streets we're getting? Four out of those 300. So when I campaigned and I saw some horrible streets, I hate to tell you, they're not on the list. So I want to see my streets in my district paved. And if, but of course, this money goes into the general fund. It can be used for anything. But you know, we as a council will direct our budget and where we want to spend it at the advice of city manager and staff, who also, I think, does a great job. But so we're going to look at everything. That's what I say is that we are not making fast decisions tonight. So I say, but let's not do area two, num, option two yet, because we don't know if it's good or bad. I think we need a little more investigation. I have some questions about how much revenue would we get. I don't know. I don't know if it's worth that much revenue. They pay a tax to the federal government. If you can correct me if I'm wrong, you pay so much to feds, you pay to the state, you pay to the cities, you pay and you pay and you pay. So we just stand in line for our for ours. So uh, it's not a sales tax; it's a tax on gross revenues. So I, I'd like to find out more about that. Way, you know, how how many roads can we do, or how many police can we add to our force? And um, so anyway, that's my thought. I I go with uh, with uh, Councilmember Middleton and Schaefer in pursuing option four. Mayor, can I get sure, go ahead. Thank you, sir. So uh, somebody, a couple of people brought up to me, I was opposed to Measure M. Measure M is a sales tax increase, and how come I'm interested in this tax? This is a sin tax. This is a, the people that are using it are the ones that are gonna pay it. We're not mandating anybody pay a tax. That's the point. That's the difference for me, is that Measure M was a mandate that everybody is gonna pay, and this is a, this is a tax that is, uh, if somebody wants to use, they're gonna buy, and they're gonna pay the tax. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, Ryan, are you in position? Um, and if, if not, that's fine too. But I wanted to know uh, if you could give us a really Reader's Digest version of option three and what that means. Uh, I'm gonna guess it means that the council first decides that uh, they wanna go forward with a tax measure and then um, is it a Prop 218 thing that has to then go out to the public or something else? Yeah, it's not, not Prop 218. So any tax does need to go to the voters to, to approve. So if you did the tax first 
and you don't have an ordinance later, you, you'd see how the tax goes. The public could decide uh, not whether they're approving mar cannabis or not. They're just deciding whether if cannabis comes, would it be taxed and to, and to what degree. So you see how that goes, and then subsequent to that, you could you could follow that up with action from the council to, to change the ordinance. Thank you you uh, could okay. do it the other way around. Okay, thank you very much. I just wanted to be clear on that. Um, um, you know, I, I want to clarify a few points because there has been some uh, information out in the public that's not correct about where I stand on things with this. But uh, I'm going to touch on a few things real quick, and that's first uh, crime related to the issue. I've spent uh, a good chunk of the last 10 or so years um, indirectly in the uh, cannabis arena as a contracted service on the uh, security side. I'm fully convinced that this is not a crime issue. Uh, um, facilities, and I've been to dozens, just tons of dispensaries, uh, warehouses, uh, they're usually extremely safe because there's armed security there. They don't allow uh, people to loiter around in the areas. Um, so I don't see any concern on the crime aspect of it. It doesn't pull in, um, you know, uh, Jimmy Hoffa or anything like that. Um, so I don't know that that should be a concern. Uh, on the tax side, uh, it has been commented a couple of times on my position on the tax, um, and I'll put it this way. Um, I'm a 150% supporter of medical marijuana. Both of my parents died from cancer in their 60s. I would have done anything for them. If they wanted me to go out and you know, find cannabis to relieve their pain and suffering, I would have done that no matter what. Um, and I think that like any other product that can be uh, used to relieve anybody's pain and suffering, um, they should be able to uh, partake in that. It's like no other you know, no different from other drugs that we take for pain and other uh, elements. Um, uh, I take almost no medications, but I'm up here suffering tremendously right now because I get muscle spasms, and I get them from sitting in a long, for a long time. Um, so if you see me squirming around up here, that's what's going on. And, and I, I take a wonderful medication that can relieve muscle spasms, like, within a minute. It's incredible. Um, but like with any other drug, it, uh, you know, things can be abused. And so... Um, I'm sure that, that some people abuse that drug, but I'm thankful that um, you know, we live in a society where despite people abusing you know, even legal drugs, medications, that we can still get them and because we do need them uh, for ailments. And so, but on the flip side, I'm also 150% opponent of recreational marijuana. Um, we've spent the last 50, 60 years uh, telling people don't smoke, don't smoke, don't smoke. Wish my parents would have listened because they both died because they smoked. But, um, and we did pretty good in educating kids, it seemed like, and things were going along pretty good. And, and now we have a product where we're telling people, you know, smoke it, smoke it, smoke it. And there are other ways to consume it, and I wish if people did partake in it, that that's what they would do and not smoke it. So I, I'm just 150% against it. I, I, I think that um, um, pushing a, uh, a solution to relieve uh, or to, to, to go into the recreational side of it um, is not a good thing for society. And so I'm against that. So th how does that relate to the tax issue? Um, it means The tax means nothing to me. It, it, it means absolutely nothing. And, and I don't care to gain a dollar off of the uh, recreational use of drugs. And so um, do we have money? Yes, we have a nice surplus. <laughs> and, and could we use more money? Oh yeah, oh yeah. You know, you want your roads paved like it's been said. Yeah, we could use money, but for me personally, I just don't feel that uh, um, taxing the recreational use of marijuana is is the way to get to that solution. Um, so um, I, I'm I'm leaving, folks. This is my last year, yeah, and uh, I'm in my final term, um, my final year, my final term, and uh, somebody else is going to sit up here soon. And so um, uh, I think tapping the brakes is not a bad idea. Um, and kind of seeing where this is going to go, maybe, or not go. Um, a couple of things that, uh, even though I may not be around for a vote on it, is I, it, if it did go forward, I'd like to see some sort of uh, uh, restriction on building signage. I don't want a big sign out there that says, welcome to the Citrus Heights Dispensary, you know, kind of a thing. I would like somebody brought up, uh, I think, a very good idea, some form or some way to uh, terminate the uh, operation if it got to be a problem for the city if it did go forward. And I know that's a risk for a business owner. You know, if I'm uh, operating a business and I've put a whole lot of money into it, um, I need to be secure that I'm going to be able to, to run my business. So there has to be a level of fairness on both sides for that kind of a thing. And it can't just be arbitrary in that we decide 
a new council comes along and they say no more. And then I'm not typically in favor of this, but I, I'm kind of okay with on this situation, maybe even some form of advisory vote in November. And that would not, uh, 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 it would not decide the, the issue, but it would at least, at least give the public a, dis, a, 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 a tool to voice where they feel about this too. And um, I don't think that's a bad idea in this situation. I'm usually against that. I think you elect us to make decisions, and if we don't, we're, we're being chicken. And, and, but in this one, maybe it's a good idea, and maybe at the same time, um, it would follow that. Uh, we could then also, you know, you could say, if supported, how do you feel about the taxes or the level of tax or something like that? So that's kind of where I'm, uh, I, I agree with my uh, Council Majority that uh, we should tap the brakes for now, um, start you know, putting together maybe a little more information, even a little more outreach. We've done good outreach, but uh, you know, we've heard some comments about maybe you know, we just didn't capture you know, everybody, and you never can capture everybody, but maybe capturing a little bit more information on it would be a good idea, um, and just uh, kind of see where we want that to go and, and go from there. And with that, uh, I, anything else? Actually, no, sir. No, no, we've, we've ended that comment period. No, it's okay. It's okay. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, you have your direction? Okay. That's it. Next item, please. Next item is regular calendar item number 12. This subject is approval of neighborhood improvement partnership fund applications. There are three resolutions before council for consideration. The first is approving uh, funding for Citrus Heights Arts, Arts, and then uh, Neighborhood Improvement Partnership funding for Sunrise Ranch Area 6. And then lastly, a resolution uh, approving funding for Sylvan Oak, or Sylvan Old Auburn, SOAR Area 10. And Mayor, if I may. Oh yes, go ahead, ma'am. Um, I have a conflict, so I'll need to recuse myself. Um, my mother is actually the Executive Director for Citrus Heights Arts, so I will go and sit in the back and wait for this item to be concluded. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Can, can't she stay for the discussion on the policies and then leave before the vote, or can she no, not discuss policy? Yeah, unfortunately, she she can't. If there was a way to separate it and have uh, discussion about the other ones first, and somehow you probably could, but because the discussion relates to the the vote, you've got to recuse yourself for the whole part. Thank you. Okay. All right. I tried. <laughs> Next up. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm Courtney Riddle with the Economic Development and Community Engagement Department, and uh, thank you for making this a fairly short evening. Appreciate that. So I'm here today to share with you the Neighborhood Improvement Partnership applications that came in for um, our community members to attend the upcoming NUSA conference. So a little bit of background for everyone. You heard a little bit tonight from some of the previous NUSA attendees. And the next com upcoming event will be held uh, May 22nd through the 24th in Lubbock, Texas. The city received three applications, one from Citrus Heights Arts, one from Sunrise Ranch Area 6, and the other from Sylvan Old Auburn Road, SOAR Area 10. The application review process uh, was that we utilized the rubric that council has seen in the past to review eligibility for each grant application to ensure that it met all of the guidelines as they are posted for the, um, the Neighborhood Improvement Partnership Program. Scoring criteria was fairly simple. Anyone that scored 29 of, at minimum score of 29 out of the 35 was recommended to the Quality of Life Committee for award. So here is a list of the rubric for the three applications, including their request for attendance. Citrus Heights Arts received a score of 30, Sunrise Ranch Area 6 received a score of 29, and Sylvan Old Auburn SOAR Area 10 received a score of 29. The total request from the three applicants was $5,400. The Quality of Life Committee met on March the 24th, pardon me, the 21st, and there was quite a discussion about um, the applications themselves. Staff provided a detailed overview of the eligibility and of the process, and from that committee, there was two separate recommendations. One council mem member supported re uh, approving all three of the applications. One council member recommended funding two requests, specifically the request from Sunrise Ranch, Area 6, with one other application being supported with no specified preference for that selection. 
So staff recommends the approval of all three of the of the, the applications for the 23-24 neighborhood improvement program funding. Okay. All right. Uh, questions or comments? Take it away, Jaina. My, I want to make my comments first because I was the other person on that committee. So the reason it was originally on a consent calendar and I asked to move this to a discussion of all council members is that we cannot send everybody to Noosa that wants to go. There's a limited pot. And I, as much as I appreciate the rubric, everybody will score 29 or 30 all the time out of the neighborhoods. So I look back and, and I'm not sure we ever had uh, the NIP money used for this event. I think that Henry had a different pot of money that he used, but because the NIP was originally for neighborhood improvement projects. I don't recall the word partnership. It was projects. So we used to do projects that improved our neighborhood, not send people off to go have a good time in Texas. So um, I ask that the council develop uh, some, some guidelines for, okay, so uh, FYI, you, in the next council meeting, two more people want to go to Noosa. And it's going, and they're, the registration is, early registration is over, the hotel, the registration is full, you're going to be staying somewhere down the street and have to Uber, bike to whatever. So it's, it's, we need criteria of who we select to send and I can suggest some, but you know, in the old days, the, if there were 10 people that wanted to go, we couldn't afford $18,000. What if everybody has from that one neighborhood has one person, then you're looking at $18,000. That's a lot of money for you know, four days in Texas. For this time, it might be one, I went to one in Alaska, and, but I was a presenter. So, and then I went to one in Spokane, in Spokane, Washington, but I was an award winner. I went to one in Memphis. Dry city didn't have a bottle of wine in it. <laughs> but there was, so, you know, it's, it limit, we limited it to two people. And that's why I, I voted for, for sure area six, because she's never been before. And I think if you've never been, that should be a criteria that gets you to go. If you are a neighborhood leader, that should be a criteria that gets you to go. If you're the REACH president, I think that should be a criteria that gets you to go, because Tanya went for five years, she was president of REACH, and she went every time. So, um, and REACH paid for it out of the REACH funds. And the, so it's kind of, um, you know, it might be that Natalie wants to go and we use REACH money for it instead of the NIP money, because you're depleting all the NIP money out of the potential projects that could benefit the community. For instance, our neighborhood wants to put in a, you know, fix our braille trail for the blind. We're not going to be able to do that because we sent four or five people to Texas. So I just think that we need guidelines. And I'm asking the council to come up with guidelines so that we don't just, you know, meet two people in a room and say, oh, let's give our taxpayer dollars away. And I just think that, you know, Natalie went last year. <clears throat> I think a second time would normally not be a criteria, but A, she's president of REACH, and B, she showed that last year when she went, she came back with, a, with an idea that changed our city. We are now doing neighborhoods, you know, the Good Neighborhood Project. We invited the, the other project to come and, and share with them. You came back with a lot of information that made our neighborhoods better, but it's for neighborhoods. So it, it was not for community groups, and I appreciate the arts want to go, but I think arts should be funded through the arts money. They, there's, arts has their own pot of money. Arts can send their people, whoever they want. But I just, I think that we should have criteria on who goes. And that's the end of my speech. Thank you very much, uh, Council Member Lopez. I, I tend to agree with um, Vice Mayor. And my question really was, I, I wasn't sure when the timing of this event was, so I wasn't sure if it was a reimbursement right now or, um, okay, so the event is still forthcoming. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with Vice Mayor that we should have um, really direct benefit to our neighborhoods. There are other monies that are available for others who might wanna attend, and I think we should separate the awards so that's not just one for all three of the applications. 
anything from council member Schaefer? Yes, uh, just I, I, I agree. Um, one of the things that I think it's really, really important that we provide some incentive for our neighborhood members to to go to this and to really bring things back. There, we've actually, you know, I went to Eugene in 2016, I think it was. Um, and they have microbreweries. It's Brew Gene. Yes, it was a it was a great trip. You had a uh, fucking leg though. And Rick Doyle brought back um, the uh, Yard of the Month program. There were a lot of, there, we've gotten a lot of uh, information out of the, I think, think the Noosa Conference is a fantastic um, event. And, and I think that realistically, the presidents or vice presidents, an officer, somebody who sits, serves on the board should be the ones that go to, that, that are eligible to go. Um, my area, uh, neighborhood five, uh, has a really str big struggle in trying to get people to volunteer for the board. Um, and and I, I think this might be an incentive for for those folks, and I would certainly um, want to set the criteria that you 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 got to volunteer to be a board to be eligible to go to Nusa. Thank you. Um, regarding the limited pot of gold or whatever, um, how much is in the pot of gold for this kind of thing? Sorry about that. The current budget for uh, neighborhood improvement project grant money is about fifteen thousand, and we have a couple of other applications that were approved this year. So, depending on what council's direction is tonight, with these three NIP applications, there will be about, I believe, twenty five hundred dollars. And then we have a couple of other applications that actually just came in the last. 24 hours that the committee would also need to consider, which would significantly reduce the current available budget. Okay, so the, the money's there. Correct. The money is there. Uh, and the money's there for a reason, that's to be used. Um, mm. You know, we have 11 neighborhood associations, not all of them are active. In front of me, I see two neighborhood associations that want to go. Normally, I would say it should be a neighborhood association kind of a thing, it kind of makes sense. Um, but because of only two applying, um, I'm, I'm inclined to support the Citrus Heights Arts uh, request this time. Um, so I, I think what we need to do is, again, focus on what's in front of us, um, and we can come back with figuring out a policy or something like that, but since we don't necessarily have one at this point, I, I don't know that we need to let it handcuff us with sending people who are very interested in making our neighborhoods better, our city better, and stuff like that. Um, this is for... $5,400, and that couldn't be a, a, a more of a drop in the bucket than anything I can think of lately. You know, this council spends or approves millions of dollars on things. And so um, I think these people stepping up to the plate, taking time out of their lives, volunteering, and willing to go to these conferences, and, and hopefully they bring something back. And, and, and But in the process... I think the least we can do is support them financially and, and handle the cost associated with doing that. I don't think it's anything but a benefit to the city at this point. Point that uh, you're gonna see two more applications come and if you, they're both from neighborhoods and one is from someone who has not gone before and one is from someone who has gone before. And if that, those two are approved, then that brings the total spending to $9,000. This is the wrong pot to use, because this is the money that people want to use. So Area 6 wants to put up signs in their neighborhood that identify Sunrise Ranch neighborhoods. I'm all for that. That's great. That's what it's for. Uh, if a neighborhood, Area 5 is doing a, a, a movie, yeah, we're doing a movie in the park, how much does that cost? 2000 so we need to keep the money for the neighborhoods to do the things it was intended to do. And it was not intended to send people to Noosa. There has to be either the community funding grant, uh, something other pot of money. It shouldn't be taken out of the NIP funds, number one. And so it never was, and I don't know how it got in there. It doesn't get that rubric, that, that wonderful rubric you use for the community grants. I think it's a good rubric, but it doesn't apply here. Everybody's going to be a 29 or 30. And so that's, that's not a good criteria for denying. So I don't know if you want to set a budget and say, okay, we'll send so many this year uh, when we do the budget. I think the application should come in February so we have everybody at the same time and not kind of piecemeal it 
And I, so I, I don't have the solution. I sit on this committee, and I don't want to sound like the bad guy, you know, but I, I just think that it's, we got we to gotta have a focus, and Sorry. we don't. I have a question, Mayor. Yes, go ahead. Okay. So, um, so we have 15,000. How much of that is allocated already? I know we talked about 2,000 is going to Area 5 for the movie in the park. Uh, this is another 5,400 if we approve this. We got another 3,600. So that, that adds up to about 11,000 out of 15,000. Uh, is there any other projects that will be denied because of this? No, so I actually should take a step back and say the total budget for this for the annual for the year is actually twenty five thousand. The ten thousand dollars that the individual neighborhood associations get collectively for their administrative fee also gets paid out of this. So the each uh, neighborhood association gets five hundred dollars a year for the administrative assistance, and Reach receives five thousand, and that takes up a little bit over ten thousand. And that's twenty five thousand. That money's budget. gone already, right? Correct. That is correct. And then Pona neighborhood five. Did receive a $2,000 award for movie nights. And at this point, those are the only applications that have been approved and paid out and allocated. Well, I know that Area 10 has one coming. And if, if all that's left in there is peanuts, $600 or $700, that's not enough to fund what we, we're waiting for Mr. Hunsinger to come up with his estimate. And that's what's holding us up, is if, my friend, Mr. Hunsinger. <laughs> if I can add two more pieces of information. Uh, first, uh, with a disclaimer that there are a couple of moving targets, given that we're in the process of reviewing and presenting to council our second round of community projects grants um, that have some moving parts inside of that as well. Uh, at this moment in time, there is about a $30,000 floating balance from the undersubscription of our nonprofit community support fund. Um, that you'll be hearing about when we bring uh, additional grant programs back before you here in the next couple of council meetings. Uh, so I would say that there is a small amount of funding available to provide some flexibility. And then the second nugget of information is that uh, the funds are available until the end of this fiscal year. So projects being considered through June 30th, 2024, and then it will be renewed um, uh, pending uh, total budget approval. Okay, so you're going to take money away from nonprofits that could have benefited with their applications to fill in the hole over here that you just drained? I wouldn't necessarily say that because we will then open up again that program in fiscal year 24-25. So there uh, was no oh, opportunity so lost. I'll wait, and then next year you're going to want to send ten people to Noosa, and then there goes the trail again. So I, I, I don't. I, I think we need guidelines of where the money comes from, how much the budget is to send people. I think Reach should pay Natalie's way. Reach has money in the bank. Why can't they pay Natalie's way? She's the president of Reach. So I think she should go, but I think we should pay for it. Uh, Mr. Mayor, if I could wait Go ahead. add to the conversation here. I was going to just mention the notion of adding some policies, and I did hear it would be helpful to have some policies around this NUSA application in the future. And certainly, if that's the will of the council, we can come back and develop that. So, Well, it's not going to be because the next council meeting, there's two more NUSA applications. Oh, right, but I'm talking about for the future. You mentioned like in the next fiscal year, if there was like 10 people that wanted to go then, we could certainly have policies that could inform next fiscal year, for instance, that could be developed, brought forward uh, for the council's consideration to make sure that uh, whatever the will of the council is relative to those policies is able to be implemented in the next fiscal year when these type of applications come forward again. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think it's a very good point that uh, we're coming up into the end of the fiscal year. These funds are there. Um, people are willing to step up and do good things for their neighborhoods, which is good for Citrus Heights. I'm going to go ahead and make a motion that we adopt a resolution Mayor. of the city council of Citrus Heights. Hold on. Oh, I just, we did have some public comments, so I just wanted to make I'm going to go make the motion, then I'll bring, okay. A resolution of the City Council of City Citrus Heights approving Neighborhood Improvement Partnership funding for Citrus Heights Arts. Okay. I'll go ahead and take the comment. Go ahead. The, oh, I'm sorry, the, the public sign comment. sheets. Yes. Amy, you have to remind me of these things. <laughs> <laughs> Got to call up Natalie Price, who's just going to to throw gasoline on the fire. Go ahead, Natalie. <laughs> here, here I go, pot stirring away. Natalie Price back up here. 
Uh, this is going to sound really silly, but um, Dr. Jane is kind of right on this. I think there should be another pot of money. I'm not saying don't approve me tonight. That'd be an idiot move on my half. Uh, but what I am going to say is this application process, no offense, was kind of a shit show, and you can put that in the minutes. I was given one application, and by the time I submitted it, yeah, my t I took my time with it. That might be my bad. But it was a whole other application that I was then presented with that needed to be turned in. Then I was told that I needed to have supports, two supports, from community organizations supporting my application. But that was not actually listed as part of the application. But now, part of the rubric is those two supports that I was given a zero on because I didn't have. That was not actually part of my grant requirements, so I'm not sure why I scored a zero. Uh, that was an entirely frustrating process. Not to mention right now before you is um, a resolution, well this one's for Citrus Heights Arts, but in a couple is for SOAR. I specifically turned in this application as Natalie Price, good old-fashioned resident of Citrus Heights, who is trying to take advantage of a grant so that I may better serve my community. I was very specific in the grant process that I did not have board support. I did not ask my board to support me in this. Yes, you I was, do. You know you have board support. Well, I have board opposed, support man. in the fact that they support me, but it wasn't a board decision to apply for a grant, and I don't want to mislead Area 10 residents but that I applied for a grant. You are the REACH president. You are yes. the REACH president. But specifically, we were told to apply as individuals, not as representatives of our neighborhood. So now for this to be put back like you're doing something that Area 10 asked is wrong. Um, with that being said, NUSA does provide opportunity for leaders like myself. Um, REACH did support Gina, Olivares, I probably slaughtered her name, but the new president of Area 6 had full board support, hence her having a letter included in her packet uh, to support a new upcoming leader. I would like to go so that I can offer supports to her. This is a new conference. This is something new. We are going to need collaboration on the back end of this. And I think that people from the arts, from the different neighborhoods can work together. And that's all I really have to say. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Ruth Fox. My name is Ruth Fox, I'm from Area 6, and you guys voiced a lot of uh, my comments, but I will have to say that I did not understand this to be a NIP fund. I knew NIP was for projects. I was, um, when I first heard about it, I understood that it was from other funding sources grants. But I am here to say that I would like our new president to attend the conference. She's new, young, and ready to take over and lead us. And I would like her to do, have those skills available that she will get from this NUSA conference. I also am on the REACH uh, committee, and so I would like Natalie to go also as our REACH leader. She needs to be there to be able to coordinate and get the extra quality assistance and collaboration from other venues, other uh, neighborhood associations from Cal all over the United States. And so I think that that needs to be uh, okayed. And I would like your consideration for both of those. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other speakers? <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, um, I'm going to redo my uh, uh, motion again. Then I make a motion that we adopt a resolution of the City Council of the City of Citrus Heights, California, approving neighborhood improvement partnership funding for Citrus Heights Arts. Not hearing a second, that motion dies. I'm going to make a motion that we pass the resolution of the City of Council of the City of Citrus Heights, California, approving neighborhood improvement partnership funding for Sunrise Ranch Area Six. I'll second it. Okay, it's been uh, moved by Mayor Daniel, seconded by Council Member Schaefer. Any comments or questions regarding the motion? Can I have a roll call vote, please? Council Member Lopez Taft? Aye. Council Member Schaefer? Aye. Vice Mayor Karpinski Costa? Yes. And Mayor Daniels? Aye. I make a motion that we pass the resolution of the City Council of the City of Citrus Heights, California, approving neighborhood improvement partnership funding for Sylvan Old 
Auburn Soar Area 10. All second. It's been moved by Mayor Daniels, second by Council Member Schaefer. Any comments or questions regarding the motion? The roll call vote, please. Council Member Lopez Taft. Aye. Council Member Schaefer. Aye. Vice Mayor Karpinski Costa. Yes. Mayor Daniels. Aye. Next item, please. We're just going to have Council Member Middleton return. Hmm. Oh, yeah, we got to wait. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, these are the socks that we gave to Alfred <laughs> from Amazon. 200 pairs, but I took one out to show people, so he only got 199. <laughs> <laughs> these are nice. This is for the homeless that he distributes, so that's kind of neat. They're not real thick, so they'll be good in the summer. And they're black, so they don't show dirt. You can purchase them for two ninety nine. <laughs> so the next item is regular calendar item number fourteen. The subject is ordinance amending Citrus Heights Municipal Code Section two thirty two regarding City Council compensation, and their recommendation is to in introduce a uh, for a first reading and waive the full reading of an ordinance amending the Municipal Code Section two thirty two regarding city council compensation and good evening mayor and council members Amy Van City Clerk. On June 29th of 2023, the governor signed Senate Bill 329 into law which amended the government code which allows for the first increase to the city council members pay maximums uh, since 1984. In 1997, when the city incorporated, the city council established the city council compensation at $600 per month, which has not been increased since 1997. So with the new Senate bill, effective January 1st, 2024, the maximum allowable compensation rates were adjusted based on um, a city's population. And based on the city of Citrus Heights uh, at population of approximately 86,000, um, this places the Citrus Heights council members' salary maximum at $1,900 uh, per month. Uh, so this item is to consider uh, an ordinance to increase council members' monthly salary to the maximum allowable per state law, which is $1,900 per month. Uh, the government code uh, section also prohibits any change in compensation during the council members' uh, or during the current council's term of office. So if this item is approved, the ordinance will become operative when a new um, member of the city council is sworn into office or when a mem member starts a new term. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, um, I just wanna clarify a few points again for those who may have missed it, it's very important. In 1999, I started on the city council, I made $600 a month. In 2024, I'm on the city council, I make $600 a month. Um, it's it's just bizarre. It's just bizarre. But that it's a it's a law that uh, the way. It, and then uh, nobody on this city council can benefit from this increase if we do this until they are elected once again or become newly on on the council. Go ahead. I just had a question. Yep. Do we know what other cities are doing? Um, I or did. Are we, we the first greedy one? Um, I did conduct a preliminary um, research into other local jurisdictions within Sacramento County to see what their current compensation rates are. And um, I know that some cities um, have also been doing some research and um, may be considering this as well. Um, and I would just like to clarify that this ordinance would become operative when a new council member um, begins a new term or is elected, but the Compensation is effective for all council members regarding if they're um, in the middle of a term. So it would all been all council members would benefit once a new council member is sworn into office and starts a new term. So I just wanted to clarify. So that, some that cities was different from the, the I thought the clarification we got previously. Uh, the city clerk's correct, it, and it doesn't need to be a new member. It could be one of you getting reelected. It just has to be after a general election cycle for it to go mm -hmm. into effect. Very good. 
Thank you. And so uh, we look at cities like the size of Sacramento where their, their uh, uh, council members are full-time jobs. Um, they're compensated much higher. They have than, offices and staff. I want staff. Yes, they, I, I, don't, I think they're 108,000 or something around that range. Correct. And I just would like to note that SB uh, 329 was not applicable to charter cities, so that is different mm -hmm. for um, charter cities. Oh. Okay. I um, had a question when this first kind of got brought up and was about our PERS liability because some of us actually don't take the health insurance. We get deferred compensation, and I didn't know if this increase, how would that affect that? Because right now it's like a match for match, at least in my case. Um, so... Uh, can't remember exactly what year, but there was a time where the council adopted a resolution providing additional benefits to council members, including um, medical, dental, vision, um, some PERS retirements. Um, so there is a $600 amount that is separate from this city council compensation that council members receive. If they choose not to use the city's benefit, they can put that $600 into a deferred compensation account. And that's considered part of the compensation? No, that well, is Well, how completely. come it's called, for me, I don't take the be medical benefits, so how, it's called deferred compensation. Why it's not, it's compensation. It's $1,200 a month we make. Right. Plus we get $100 when we go to these meetings downtown. You do. Some of them, <laughs> some of them, yeah. STA doesn't pay. Sewer used to pay 400 a month. Now that it's being merged, it's 200 a month if they have two meetings. If I may ask that we don't muddy the waters with other numbers, uh, the main conversation is... Oh, but that helps me to make a decision about what, how I'm going to vote. No, no, no. Yeah. I, I mean, according to our compensation from this oh, position rather than other compensations in other municipalities. Okay. Um, okay. Any other questions or comments? Do we need to set that amount tonight, or how would that happen? As the ordinance is presented, it is uh, recommended to go to the maximum amount, which is $1,900. I mean, certainly the council can um, choose to lower that if that's the pleasure of the council, but that's the item as presented tonight. Okay. Very good. Any questions or comments? Any motions? I move approval. Okay, that was easy. Uh, any seconds? Second. Okay, it's been moved by uh, Council Member Schaefer, seconded by Council Member Lopez Taff. Any questions or comments regarding the motion? Hearing none, um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? No. Okay, motion passes. Next item, please. The next item is department reports. That item has been continued to a future city council meeting. The next item is city manager items. Um, and No updates this evening. Next and then item, the next item is items requested by council members yeah. or future agenda items. Anything? Go ahead. I have two. Um, the first one's easy. Um, I'm not sure where it stands right now, but there is a bill floating around that I saw on the League of Cities uh, email that we got that would um, stall property tax assessments on ADUs for three years. This would kill a lot of cities, and, and the League of Cities is opposed to it. But I was hoping we could get maybe an um, update or where that is and what it does. And we have a lot of ADUs. And then you have the people that are building an ADU of a lot more than 1,200 square feet and calling their crappy little house their ADU. So you would be not getting the property tax from the big house and you get your Prep 13 tax from your crappy little house. So it, it's kind of a misnomer of what an ADU is. So I, I would just kind of get an update because if, if it's something we need to keep track of for sure. and. And so I appreciate the league's heads up on it. They, like I say, position, their position is against. So if that's something we can do, and Portia's got her hand I'm over there. I'm yeah. seeing some nodding heads there. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing is I'd like a second to just entertain the idea of suspending our um, 
our planning commission for a year or two. Um, I think that when I, I provided uh, the city manager and Casey uh, a, a, for the last two and a half years, what they've done or what, whether they've met at all, because a lot of times they don't meet and I'm happy to provide the rest of the council the same document. Uh, it's like nothing's happened there. And we have attorney that sits there, we have a clerk that sits there and it, we have staff. So we look at a zoning code and then we go tell them what we did and then they look at SB9 updates after we get the SB9 updates and then it, it's nothing different. They don't do anything different. The big projects like Sylvan Corners had to come to us anyway. So it's, it's not like they do any work. I'm sorry, they don't. The simplest thing they've done is a lot split. I think that you've made that request. Okay. I think we have to not go on too All much. All right, well, we I'm just wanna, saying that is why. We don't why, want to get into That's why I'm, I want to justify my question. That's I understand. All right. And if I could get a second just to talk about it. I'll be polite. We can talk about it. Thank you, Portia. <laughs> okay, anything else? Anybody? Okay, we're adjourned. Thank you very much.